Will the receivers be pushed up the draft board again tonight? Where will we see the first tight end double up? And which of these 12 teams will dominate this draft from beginning to end? Follow along with the live draft board tonight and watch our pick-by-pick -pick analysis as we call the action from the 2022 FFPC Pros versus Joes. Get them a body bag, League Two, to see who's going to win a 2023 FFPC main event squad. We've got a great show for you. Farrell Elliott is here. I'm Eric Falkman. Stick around. Your high-stakes fantasy football hour starts now. And the pressure. I've seen greater men than Broadcast live and heard around the world, you are now watching the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. Welcome to the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com with your hosts Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for analysis from the best players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here are Eric Baltman and Farrell Elliott. Silence in the scripture, are we not all our father's sons? I became a man, nobody ever told me what a man was. Thank you, Rob. Greetings and salutations, all you Balkaholics and Ferelliacs. Welcome to the latest episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com. I'm your slightly above average host, Eric Balkman. My co-host is the definitive commissioner of fantasy football, Farrell Elliott. Tonight, we have the second of six extra special episodes for you. It's the 2022 FFPC Pros versus Joes. Get them a body bag. League number two draft tonight. We'll be covering it until its completion. Shout out to the chat room right now. Post any questions you might have with us or for us in there. The show is at HSFF Hour. I am at Eric Balkman. Farrell is at J. Farrell Elliott. The Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship is at KFFSC. You can connect with us on Facebook dot com slash HSFF hour. And uh, you can also email the show at the inbox, high stakes fantasy football at gmail.com. If you have any questions for us, send them in now. We'll try to get to them all throughout the program tonight. All the chat room questions, all the tweets, all the emails. Uh, thanks to the hard work of our producer and mutual friend, Rob, and our audio engineer, my best friend, Bryce. Tonight, midnight Pacific time is indeed the deadline for the 2022 FFPC main event early draft slot announcement. When you pay for your team in full, you'll get your draft slot on August 1st. And remember, if you already have a team. You're going to get $400 off each additional team that you add on. Square those balances away now at MyFFPC.com. Remember, for the first time in season-long fantasy football history, the FFPC is giving away three six-figure grand prizes as the first, second, and third place prizes and a million-dollar first place prize this year. Million bucks. Incredible. Uh, let's talk about uh, tonight's draft tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the uh, six pro, well, let's go in order. Drafting first tonight, Hussein Aksu from Fantasy Couch, Roy Perenzuela and Corey Hanstein from uh, the FFPC Joe Consortium. They are picking second. Todd Burrows from the Run to Daylight podcast is drafting third. Michael App, the I believe the 2016 Football Guys Players Championship overall winner, he's picking fourth. Jason Petropoulos from Roto Fantasy Football is drafting fifth. Michael Zuka, former guest of this program, a uh, big-time high-stakes player, is drafting sixth. Peter Overzet from Fantasy Life is picking seventh. Julio Fuentes, the FFPC Joe, is eighth. John Hanson from Fantasy Points and Sirius XM Fantasy Football Morning is drafting ninth. Josh and Laura Dern picking tenth. Curtis Patrick from Rotoviz. Ryan McDowell from Dynasty League. Uh, football uh, conjoining their two uh, franchise uh, websites together tonight to pick 11th. And of course, another former guest of the show and future guest of the road of his high stakes lowdown, Brian Harris. He is picking 12th tonight. Bring in my co-host, Farrell Elliott. Farrell, welcome in. We are at night two. I'm going to bring up the draft board right now. I think last night went pretty well and we're in for another banner night. I just read off the pros and Joes. It's quite the lineup again. Yeah, we got guys conjoining, which always is a good thing. And we've got yeah, Bucky, look at all those yellow stickers. <laughs> wow. A lot of wide receiver ones. We saw it last night. We saw the wide receivers push up. We'll get to the first round in, in a second here uh, and, and go over it. I don't want to delay here and bring in tonight's first guest who has been patiently waiting here. You know him from Serious Fantasy Football Mornings on Serious XM Fantasy Football Radio, uh, Fantasy Sports Radio, uh, the majority owner of Fantasy Points and obviously an analyst for DirecTV's Fantasy Zone channel, a Hall of Famer in the Fantasy Sports Writers Association, and a working actor, which I wasn't aware of, but let's bring him in right now, at Fantasy underscore Guru, John Hansen. Welcome aboard, man. Happy to have you. Oh, what's up, Eric? Yeah, yeah, that, that is true. That is technically correct. I'm a working actor, and uh, I'm a, a, almost on the clock, but uh, great, <laughs> great to be here. 
And uh, yeah, I got weird right out of the gate here with my first pick. <laughs> so, 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 so let's okay. So before we, uh, Guru, before we get to your second round pick, you went with CD Lamb in the first round. So this was not something you plotted out beforehand. I beg your pardon. This was not so you didn't expect to take CD Lamb in the first round. No, no, I did. Um, okay, but it, it, it was it was more about the guy that I'm going to take. And uh, just just absolutely loving uh, the, the combination here. Um, and I'm going to take them right here. Uh, this is what I call gorific. Uh, I cannot quit, you know, trying to be, you know, ahead of the curve. And I like trying to get guys, you know, at their breakout on their breakout season. So I just took C.D. Lamb and Javante Williams I mean, these two dudes are absolute studs. They're 23 years old. They're going to be featured for their team. I know Melvin's back. I don't give a crap about Melvin. So that's how I like to play. I, I like to be aggressive and be ahead of the curve. You Is don't something- care about Melvin. And, and, John, welcome to the show and welcome to the draft. A man with your resume and all your experience is going to draw a lot of attention tonight. I am on your IMDB page right now. I like to yeah. challenge all competing agents no matter what field they're in. <laughs> Uh, and, and I actually have an IMDb Pro account, and, and, nice. and you know I'm going to contact your agent and tell him to dress this up because you're a handsome man. You deserve a picture here on your <laughs> IMDb page, and you know, congratulations to you, brother. You, you, how has your involvement in fantasy football across all these media portals made the game more enjoyable for you? Oh, um, I think the best way for me to uh, answer that question is. Uh, to talk about what I kind of set out to do when I was a young kid and, you know, young man, which is to be actually in, in a broadcasting environment. That was really my, my dream. So it's a long story, but basically through fantasy sports, I, I was able to, you know, have a broadcasting career. So, I mean, that, that's the, the, the number one thing that sticks out to me. I mean, among many things. Well, congratulations to that and keep it up, sir. Thank you. Um, John, so when you talk about drafting these breakout guys and getting them like in their breakout year, that's how you win fantasy leagues. Are we going to see more picks like this for you in pros versus Joe's tonight? Guys that you expect to break out this year and be ahead of the curve on a lot of these players ahead of the other 11 competitors tonight? Yes, because guys, I am so old that (laughs) the only thing that keeps me engaged is just go balls to the wall Full DGAF mode. I don't give a rat's ass. I'm not afraid to lose. Let's go. And and that's the other thing. I mean, like, I think that's the mentality that you have to have in pros versus Joe's because second place, as I said last night, you don't even get a pair of socks like the, the caddy day right. caddy shack. Like, you get nothing. So first place, it's all about that. Um, talk a little bit about – let's talk about CeeDee Lamb here as long as you picked him at, at, at the 109. Obviously, no Amari Cooper this year. Michael Gallup coming off the ACL. Do you feel like most of the fantasy industry is sleeping on Lamb, given his talented quarterback, given his elite offense, and the fact that he could be a massive, maybe even a top three receiver overall this year? No, I don't think um, we're sleeping on him. I, I think I, I like to talk about ADP, good ADP is like, you know, high quality polling data. And I, I think the markets uh, were very aggressive on Lamb last year, and I was with them. And it's just one of those things that didn't necessarily work out. But I think he's priced very appropriately. Obviously, I just took his ass at nine. Yeah. And his, his ADP is 14. But again, that for me, that was about the Javante Williams, C.D. Lamb pairing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I figured I could – I had a better chance of getting that done by going Lamb first, surprisingly, which it worked. So that was my route there. John, do you feel like you're getting a discount on Javante Williams because people – not not you, but other people are worried about Melvin Gordon, and that's making Javante Williams fall to you in drafts? I do, yeah. And I said that last year. Uh, you know, the number one league we talk about on the radio show, for those who know, uh, the ACI, I took him in the second round on the air. In like 20, it was like 25 overall. People are like, what? I mean, it wasn't <laughs> the greatest pick. But it's pretty good, you know, down the stretch. So I think it'll be something. In a football uh, guy's slow draft that I started today, uh, C.D. Lamb was the number 10 player off the board, the number Mm. four wide receiver. So I think you and uh, this gentleman are setting the new pace for C.D. Lamb, John. 
John, how do you how do you and I know you're drafting in that twenty five hundred dollars Superflex Dynasty League, but when you're dra- drafting redraft like this in a tight end premium format like the FFPC, how do you normally handle tight ends in in this format? Do you like to get an elite guy early, or you kind of just let the draft come to you? I'm just wired for some reason to seek out tight end sleepers. Yeah, it, I, early in my career, I had a lot of success. You know, if I if I was fortunate enough to ever play in the NFL, that probably would have been my position. Uh, so I always felt like I was pretty good a gauge of the talent there. Um, so I guess I'm pre-wired. You know, I was like Antonio Gates was my breakout player in 04. Jimmy Graham, I literally begged people, like I'm on my hands and knees, please do this. And that year he broke out, whatever year that was. So I've had a lot of great success. So I just can't. I just can't take them early. And I will say I was a big Kelsey guy. Like I literally was friends with um, Herbie Teope, as you, you may know, who covers the chiefs. Mm-hmm. The, the second year in the league for him, he was coming back from micro fracture surgery. And I was a big Kelsey guy. I sat with him at the combine his rookie year. And I, I told him it was ridiculous. He didn't get his own podium. Uh, it was that big, <laughs> he, had, he had like a little table. But I was literally getting daily updates on Kelsey, uh, you know, his first OTA in May, uh, the second year in the league. That's how into him I was. So I just love getting the sleeper tight ends, basically. Uh, Guter, you are on deck here. You already have CeeDee Lamb, the fifth wide receiver off the board, the eighth running back off the board in Javante Williams here. What are you thinking with this next pick? And I and I know you're thinking about another breakout guy because you're trying to win this league, get that free 2023 FFPC main event entry. What are you thinking here as far as a player, or perhaps a position as you are now on the clock? Well, see, one, one thing I like about going running back wide receiver or whatever is because now I, I, I'm flexible. So now I just I go in full BPA mode and I'm an, a major ageist. If you're like 25, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'd run it back. I'm like, you're an old man, dude. So <laughs> I look at young studs, I believe, and I just go for it like Brees Hall okay. uh, who is the best back in the class. And basically I got him in the third round. Brees Hall next year uh, at the latest will be a second round pick. Speaking yeah. of ahead of the curve, I, I have been saying, and Farrell has been saying on this show for the last several months, Brees Hall is going to be creeping up as we get to main event time in Las Vegas at Planet Hollywood. Very excited for that. And Brees Hall uh, creeping up again. John Hansen, the fantasy guru, uh, creeping up the Brees Hall ADP tonight. We were going to let you go. Enjoy your fourth round pick. Good luck the rest of the way. We'll continue to listen to you on Sirius XM Fantasy Football Morning from 6 a.m. until 9 a.m. Uh, uh, weekday mornings on 10 a.m. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Beg your pardon, 10 a.m. Uh, I missed that last hour. Thank you for correcting me. And we'll follow you on Twitter at fantasy underscore guru. Check out all the stuff you're churning up for fantasy points as well. Thanks so much for dropping by the, uh, the podcast tonight, John. And good luck the rest of the way, man. You got it, guys. Enjoyed it. Later. See you, John. Thank you. John Hansen, ladies and gentlemen, the fantasy guru taking Brees Hall at the 309 tonight to go with Javante Williams. And Farrell, there is there is some added um benefit to doing that in a format where you have to get first place to win uh anything. Let's go with the breakout guys. Maybe you don't hit on all of them, but if you hit on some of them, man, a lot of teams are gonna be chasing you the rest of the way. Yeah, and he went much, much later last night. So, yeah, way to go, John. Get out there and get your guys. you got to love your guys. It's a Lance Turbs thing, Balky. I got my guys. Got, get your guys, exactly. You know, Brees Hall. I, go ahead. I, I, um, you know, it, I, I like the way he approaches this business. I like the way he talks about tight ends. He might actually be able to add to his resume, get a job with the New York football giants here pretty soon. With his I, knowledge of the how, how was I what I don't understand like how was how did he not get a minority role in uh draft day I mean that would have been perfect for him right I've already challenged the agent balky let's okay. leave it all right there. so then yeah I'll leave we it have an agent that's connected out there yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bring the courts into this podcast yet maybe later on but we won't bring them <laughs> in now we're gonna let everybody we're gonna be civilized tonight yes uh, civilization is needed everywhere 
Exactly. Brees Hall, by the way, normally in the uh, FFPC best ball tournament, which you can play at myffpc.com right now for 125 bucks, take your chance at a $200,000 payday. Uh, Brees Hall, according to the ADP provided to us by the godfather of pros versus Joe's, Darren Armani at Fantasy Mojo on Twitter, fantasymojo.com. Brees Hall going at the 401 on average. If Guru wants him, probably has to take him here in the third round because there's a really good chance he does not make it back to him here at the 404. Uh, we are in the fourth round. I'm not going to bother to go over pick by pick in this analysis. No real surprises in the first round, Farrell. I mean, I guess the probably the biggest one would be CeeDee Lamb at the 109, and we already heard Guru's input uh, on that of why he took him there. Solid reasoning. Uh, and then he gets Javante Williams in the second round as well. Uh, I'm not really seeing anything in the first two rounds I necessarily want to talk about. Do you think Debo Samuel for Hussein Aksu at the one spot at the 212 was a reach? I really don't. I can see the, I can see the argument for Samuel as a second-round pick. Samuel's a multi-use, talented player. Whoever plays quarterback, he's going to do fine. Who's number 10? Who's team 10? Team 10 is Josh and Laura Durham. Josh Durham was on the High Stakes Fantasy Footballer just about a month or so ago, Farrell. We Josh. talked to him then. So Josh and Laura, the FFPC Joe tandem, picking in team uh, in slot number 10 tonight. So if you take them, I, I like what they're doing. I would have taken Adams over Lamb. I would have right. taken Phil Cole Williams. And oh, I would have okay. taken Travis Etienne over Hall. So every move they've made, I would have – I prefer those moves to what John did. So I, I'm going to watch this one closely because, you know, John's got his reasons for drafting who he's drafting. But I really like what Team 10 is up to doing. And they're on the clock. They are on the clock, and everything is coming up Derm and Dermer as their team name dictates, <laughs> right? They get another PPR uh, Wunderkind in Jalen oh, Waddle here that. with the 403. So a lot of a lot of targets on this day. I love collecting targets in, in this format. Like, you collect targets of the running back, receiver, and tight end position, you are going to be well off. Um, coming up in the third round, you have Alvin Kamara. Uh, going um, to uh, at, at the 302 tonight. That's Roy Perenzuela and Corey Hanstein taking him as their uh, number one running back. Darren Waller coming off the board at the 305. What do you make of Michael Pittman at the 306 to Michael Zuka here, Farrell? I know you have a soft spot in your heart for Michael Pittman this year. Love Michael Pittman. That's as high as I'm going to go for Michael Pittman. I loved it better when he was in the seventh and sixth and fifth fourth round <laughs> but now now you know he's there let's go back to the derms my new favorite team Bucky <laughs> targets be gone there's over 400 catches in those first four players and uh, that, them, you know that, that is accurate that is accurate Goodness. my friend um let's get into as long as we are uh talking in we're talking about this format right right now by the way the same and i think i just mentioned this the exact same format as the ffpc best ball tournament if you yes. watch this podcast you know that uh i have been covering the ffpc best ball tournament with my co-host who's been drafting in the ffpc best ball tournament we've done two of these live drafts um we're going to do another one coming up in about two weeks in fact it might be I'd have to ask him. I think it's like two weeks from tonight or, or maybe two weeks from yesterday. But I want to bring him in right now. You know him from this show. You follow him on Twitter, at Dave Turp. He's here to talk analysis on uh, these 12 teams tonight. Please welcome in Dave Turpoli, ladies and What's gentlemen. What's up, guys? What's going on? We, uh, we're excited to hear you. So you are, you're very – one of the things I love about you, Dave, is you, you, you mix – you don't mix words, right? Or mince words. Excuse Not me. at all. And I don't plan you, on it right now. No, you tell it like it is. So what's standing out? Three rounds into this draft. What's standing out? I mean, there's some really good teams to start off. Three, Todd is killing it so far. Team four looks really nice. Team six, really good. Team seven, solid. Team 10, we talked about. I just heard right. you guys talking about. It's exceptional so far. Um, mm -hmm. John Hansen's team. Sorry. Well, okay, so now like the John Hansen. <laughs> so Turf, let's talk about this here because he is going for being a year er, not a year early on these guys, but he's trying to get them before everybody else is aware of them. And you have to win first place in this league to get anything, right? Winning the overall means nothing. All you gotta do is beat out these other 11 owners for a free 2023 FFPC main event. Easy. So knowing that, I mean, you're drafting a little bit differently in the best ball tournament, but knowing that, that you have to beat out these other uh, 11 owners, you still don't like the strategy of getting Lamb in the first, Javante Williams in the second, Brees Hall. See, Lamb's David. fine. Javante Williams over DeAndre Swift over Barkley. Mm -mm, not for me. No way. No chance. Mike what Evans. About, what about Brees Hall? You got Hall? on the list. 
What about Brees Hall in the third? At the I end don't the mind that. that. That that upside's there. Like you said, he's going to creep up when we get to Vegas. You know, playing at Hollywood as we get close to the live drafts and like the end of the season where it's going to start ramping up. I'm fine with Brees Hall. I'm fine with Gabriel Davis, but the Javante Williams pick. He's, he's rising in drafts right now, and I don't really understand why. Melvin sure. Gordon's still there. He's still a worry. Right. It's Except for John Han- John Hansen's not worried about him. Mm. He's I, a I minority because I know a lot of smart people that I that, talk that, to, like, a lot Melvin, of smart people okay. in this industry do not like Javante Williams this year. Um, and I would, I would, and John Hansen's obviously smart as well, so you have the opposite, the polarizing ends of, of the spectrum here. 100%. With, with, with the Denver ground game. Um, Turf, do you have a favorite slot so far this year? Because I know you talk, you centered out or you singled out team three, four, five, six uh, tonight's draft, and obviously team ten have strong drafts. Do you have a favorite slot that that you've been getting? Whether it's football guys, whether it's um, the best ball tournament that that you really like your teams from. I like being in the middle. I just feel like you could do so much with your drafts. You're kind of stuck at the end. I hate being number one. Really don't like being number two. I feel like it's there's a little bit of a drop off after like. Aaron Jones, Fournette has some questions. Kamara has some questions. I'm not the biggest Tyreek Hill, Debo Samuel guy. Chubb is not really for me. So, like, you're kind of like – you might be reaching a little bit to get your guys if you're picking number one. We know how much I love Travis Etienne, so I don't care about the news today. It's really hard for me to ever pass on him, but I don't like being – about the news today of James Robinson uh, starting the season – uh, in in camp, but not on the PUP list. Correct. If anything, I think that just helps me. Yeah. Because why, people why are going to see that, that yeah. and why people are going to react to that news like it's James Robinson is going to be like a timeshare type of guy. I don't see it. No, I, I really think there's two positions for those guys, especially on third downs. Um, Terp, you talked about – and one of the things I love about being at 11, 12, perhaps as if you've got a couple of decisions to make, they become easier decisions. You can get both players, but I'm leaning towards you. The middle rounds seem to be the rounds that, that I've been most comfortable with and have the best options. And I've never, I've never really felt that way before. Um, naturally you're going to make a run at it wherever you end up in these drafts. Uh, you're an East coast guy. Uh what is your – like, I see Gabriel Davis here. Gabriel Davis is a player we've consistently been high on on the show. There's no way I would take him in the fourth round. Uh, your consensus related to the geography that you're in, uh, how does that play into your fantasy football preparedness? I mean, I'm a big Eagles guy, so obviously, you know, I try to get down there as much as possible and see all that stuff that's going on in the division, obviously with the Giants, the Redskins, Commanders, whatever you want to call them, and then the Cowboys. But, I mean, it seems like this fourth round, like the way it's going, like we just mentioned Gabriel Davis, it is literally all over the place in drafts. Like I've seen Gabe Davis go there, and then I've seen him flip to the fifth round. It seems like these receivers are kind of all interchangeable in some people's eyes. So it's kind of just a mixture of kind of like, like, like John said, when he was on here, go get your guy. I'll always respect the mentality. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. John yeah, said he's not afraid to lose. And that goes right. a long way. Yeah. yeah like, 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 like you guys said, this league is, if you come in second place, congratulations, you get nothing. If you come in 12th, <laughs> people might make fun of you, but who cares? All that you, come in 12th, you come in 12th, you get the same thing as second place. Yeah, You get the same respect as yeah. the guy who came in second. There's no, there's nothing involved with it. So, Go get your guys. I'll come on here and make fun of you. And then when you win, you can come on here and make fun of me. <laughs> That's what makes this great. That's what makes this great. Exactly. Um, Gabriel Davis, as Terp was saying, uh, he goes at the 404 tonight to John Hansen from Fantasy Points. Uh, uh, according to the uh, Best Ball Tournament ADP over the last five days, he has fluctuated about a round and a half right right now. Um, he settled in at the 504, but he's gone as high as the 406, as late as the 511. So once again, John Hansen uh, putting his money where his mouth is here, getting Gabriel Davis, the bulked up Gabriel Davis, up to 227 pounds this year. We'll see what he does in Buffalo. Farrell, we talked about this last night, all these receivers going. Here we are through five, four and a half rounds tonight. We already have 26 receivers off the board. Why are the receivers, you think, getting pushed up in these two first drafts of the pros versus Joes this season? Everybody's getting ready to play in Kentucky, except Terp, who won't come down here. But, God, we would we would love to have One of these years you're going to get me. 
I don't yeah. know because I see the position being so deep. And we don't see anyone here in the fifth round. Well, team number two has three running backs after starting with two elite receivers. Uh, I, I sort of like their uh, I sort of like their philosophy. Uh, so I can't answer that question, Balky. I tell you what, those tight ends are flying off the board, almost in the same spots that we saw them come off with. Good drafters like these guys aren't going to waste early picks on quarterbacks, even with the fact you want two or three of them. So I don't know, with depth with depth at wide receiver that I see in this draft, Dave Turp said that many – Players see some of the receivers as interchangeable. Mm -hmm. I see elite receivers, but I see elite receivers throughout the entire draft. So I, I'm going to get some running backs if I'm sitting there pushing on these buttons. And you know, Hanson talked about his, uh, Hanson talked about his Hollywood experience. Uh, Terp, Terp was in Silver Linings Playbook. I, I saw him in the fight scenes once or twice. In, in, in when they went, to, when they went, he to might have been. You know, I, yeah, I think you were there. I, th I definitely think you were there. I'm going to stop you right there. Now I don't know if you're messing with me or not. Because mm -hmm. I know where Turp is from, and I know yeah. where the setting no, is from. So, 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 so we're, Turp, were you an extra in Silver You might have to watch table? the movie and see. I had yeah. seen it, but I wasn't looking for you, though. You might have to watch it again, see. <laughs> Local girl Jennifer Lawrence speaks well yes, of you, Turp. That's, that's, that's right. That's, Jennifer Lawrence, the pride of Louisville, next to Farrell Elliott, of course, um, uh, was in that flick. And then uh, Terp's best friend, Bradley Cooper, apparently, uh, oh, got, him a, got him a Big role. Bradley Cooper guy. <laughs> Did Terp a good job to, in that film, Terp. Very good movie. Goes to Eagles games with Bradley Cooper all the time. Um, and Maybe. I have to and now I know what I'm You're going to so have after, to rewatch it. After the program tonight, new episode of Better Call Saul, and then I'm watching there you the go. playbook. All right, so one of the uh, – Tarek Bryant Jr. in the YouTube chat right now is talking about Team 3. That's Todd Burroughs from the Run to Daylight podcast. Terp, he, he says he loves Team 3. I think you commented on this earlier. You like Exceptional. the start. McCaffrey and Aaron Jones, A.J. Brown, Allen Robinson, Rashad Bateman. Todd's done a ton of best ball so far, and it's kind of showing right here with this start. He lives in the best ball streets. I mean, he is extremely <laughs> talented. He knows how to structure a good team. The McCaffrey-Jones start, you can't really ask for much better. And then just stacking receivers, you know, it's the best draft in this in this league by far, in my opinion. Yeah, so it, far, it, so far, so far, right? And and we're only about twenty five percent into it. We have one, two, three. We got seven tight ends off the board. We got two, only two quarterbacks off the board. Yeah, Farrell, once again, Josh Jacobs falls to the sixth round. Brian Harris taking him there. He continues to be a steal right now because of how far he's slipping, in your opinion, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very happy with Jacobs here. And that's the type of running back that's going to be your number two running back when amongst your first five picks, you spend one on tight end. You got Andrews and uh, Brian also uh, went quarterback early with Josh Allen. So that's what you're going to have in the sixth round, Josh Jacobs. He was fortunate that that player was still there. We haven't had a, a running back taken since Antonio Gibson, uh, middle of the fifth. So he could have lost uh, both Jacobs and Elijah Mitchell. Uh, fortunately for him, he got Jacobs. And and Terp, in regards to coming to Kentucky, you know, I've had the pleasure of seeing and uh, your lovely wife on the social media pages and the support and relationship you guys have. Uh, if, you know, if I were you as speaking as a, a aged bachelor, I would never leave home either. I wouldn't go anyway. I just she's I awesome. She keeps me in line. I tell you what, I don't know what kind of fantasy football season you're going to have, but how many years have you been married? I was married November 20th last year. So not well, that's the yet. best damn day's work you ever did. I'm going to write down November 20th. Way past work. my pay grade. Way past. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're I think you're matching up pretty good out there, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Terp, uh, team two tonight. That's Roy Perenzuela and, and Corey Hanstein. We have seen um, a lot of these drafts, and you've seen a lot of these draft drafting in, mm -hmm. in the best ball tournament. Start off with running backs early. They go with Cooper Cup and Tyreek Hill, and then go with the running backs after that. What can you say about that strategy, attacking the receiver position like they did in the first two rounds and now hammering three straight running backs? I'm fine with Kamar. I'm fine with Akers. I, I think Kamar is somebody I'm sky high on, and the only thing that's not – that's stopping him from being a late first, early second, in my opinion, is a suspension. If that gets cleared, I mean, he's going to be going at the end of the first round, beginning of the second round in almost yes. every draft. So his upside right now, you got to take a shot. In this type of contest, if you can get him here before potential news breaks next week, um, people will keep saying August 1st is the date. You, you can't pass him up. The David Montgomery pick, 
I don't really agree with. Um, this, but what he did with Acres here, guys, you take a situation, if, if you're going to handcuff, if you're going to stack, those are inexpensive handcuffs uh, with, with 100%. Anderson and, and Williams. Uh, and I really like Acres in this format. This is the only place I would want to have those Rams running backs to try to figure out who to play. But, you know, that's the Super Bowl champion starting running back at the end of the fourth round. That's not a bad move. No, um, no. Farrell, uh, we, we have a couple of conversations going on in the YouTube chat right now. I want to center on what Todd Burroughs is saying. It seems like he's pretty ticked off at Mike Zuko, who's tra uh, drafting in the sixth spot tonight, taking Dallas Goddard here tonight at the 607. I believe that was Todd Burroughs' next pick. Uh, Goddard yeah. going to Zuka, but he makes up for it in J.K. Dobbins. Is that a Does nice... he make up for it, though? That, okay, I guess that was my question here. Is, is Dobbins a nice consolation for not getting Goddard here in the sixth? I, not for me. I mean, there's so many questions with the Baltimore running backs right now, and why would he just take another receiver? What about you, Farrell? <laughs> what do you think about the Dobbins pick? Uh, he doesn't need him here, and it's too big a risk. And, and you know, we were talking about how these great drafters has only taken two quarterbacks and how they're going to wait on quarterbacks. And then we had a quarterback run in round six with four guys. It, and I'm not saying he should have kept in that run. But, yeah, there's there's better choices in Dobbins there, especially with the way teams two and one are leaning. I don't think they would have taken Dobbins. So Dobbins would probably be available at the seven spot as you came back around. Yeah. And he could have stacked A.J. Brown. Yeah. And, and, well, let's talk about the stacks, guys, because <clears throat> that's the other conversation going on in the chat right now is in and, and Darren Armani brought it up. All these quarterbacks are naked so far. There are no stacks. Jalen hurts to parents, whale and hands No Eagles there. Mahomes to uh, Jason Petropolis from Broto fantasy. No chiefs there. Although as some of the other users in the YouTube chat room pointing out, it's easier to stack Mahomes later, but Kyler Murray to Julio Fuentes, no Cardinals, Joe Burrow to John Hansen, no Bengals, Lamar Jackson, to Josh and Laura Durham, no Ravens. Justin Herbert to the to Rotoviz and uh, DLF guys and, and Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell, no Chargers uh, there. And then Josh Allen, uh, no Bills for Brian Harris there. Although I will say Curtis Patrick chiming in saying, if I can get Herbert in the sixth round, I don't care how many Chargers I have on my team. I'm drafting Herbert there, you know. And, and there's and, Chargers and, still available. And there are Chargers still available. But, but and, and Terp, Farrell and I were talking about this last night. Stacking is important in this format. Stacking is 100% important, especially in a league where nobody's doing it. If I'm Todd, <laughs> I take Hurts instead of Dobbins. And mm, mm -hmm. you probably still get Dobbins or, you know, a, another tight end if you like one of those guys. Or, like I keep saying, stack more receivers. <clears throat> there's another there's another quarterback he could be looking at as he's on the clock here at the 703 that that could still create a stack for him i don't and know he doesn't what he, do it he oh he doesn't okay you guys are ahead of me oh no you're right yeah i'm looking at yeah he didn't do it there he gets russell very Wilson confused by those last two picks um farrell we're seeing a lot of quarterbacks off the board tonight eight quarterbacks here in the first uh six plus rounds um <clears throat> and i wonder and we probably won't see it on the right side of the draft board because we're seeing five of those six teams already with quarterbacks over there I wonder if there's going to be more of a need for the teams without quarterbacks to take one right now. Mm, yes, and there's still some very, very good ones out there, right. of course. That that uh, and and perhaps some of the next picks will set up their quarterback run in the eighth and ninth. Uh, I I look um, um, where where's our team that I like so much with uh, uh, that's with uh, Adams, that's, uh, the ten team, team Josh yeah. and Laura Durham. You know and and. They, um, you know, they take Lamar, and and you can't argue with taking Lamar. But man, oh man, there were some some late value stacks there that they could have uh, really taken advantage of. So I would have been curious to know what other position player other than quarterback that they would have taken at that spot. I guess Todd, we'll never know. Todd saying in the YouTube chat, he doesn't care about stacking in this. He says to call him in a month at Dobbins at the 610. Um, well, Todd, I'll tell you this. Call us right now uh, on, on the <laughs> team yard and get on the phone. And, and we'd love to have you and, and talk to you about your team because we do like it by and large. All of us really like it. Um, we don't have to love every single one of your picks. And, and the Dobbins one's the one we called out, but there's a bunch of other good picks that we really love there. Obviously, Russell Wilson uh, getting that elite of a quarterback here in the seventh round certainly bodes well for you as well. Um, Terp, I, Farrell and I talked a little bit about this last night. Juju Smith-Schuster continues to get a lot of love, even though the presence of Travis Kelsey is there, and even though 
Uh, the Chiefs paid Marquez Valdez Scantling a whole lot more money than Juju Smith Schuster. What are your thoughts on Smith Schuster as a six round pick this year as uh, Peter Overzet made him? Nope, not for me. I'm an MVS Sky Moore guy. I'm actually a huge Sky Moore guy. Um, I just don't, like you said, follow the money. If they really believed in him, people keep saying, you know, I read a couple articles in the, la in the last week, he could possibly catch 100 balls. I don't see it. I mean, is he, but you have to get some pieces of the Kansas City offense. Mahomes is, you know, the target share of Tyreek Hill is gone. Travis Kelfie's still there, but he's getting up there in age. Right. All these receivers, somebody's going to emerge. Could it be Juju? Of course it could be, but I'm not high on him. I'm not banking a six-round pick on him. How would you feel if the, those names you mentioned, including Schuster, do, mm -hmm. do you see the possibility that three of those four names – uh, have have a thousand yards, and do you see Schuster? Um, if you don't see him with a hundred, where do you see him with receptions? Because you know, I when we talk about the money here, they're making a long term investment in in MVS, a speed player at the position. Schuster's making a one year investment in the team, and the team's making a one year investment in him. Uh, I like I like all those players. Uh, I like Schuster better, obviously, than you do. How many catches do you see for Schuster? What is a successful season for him? I think he's going to be the fourth most receptions on the team. Less receptions uh, than Sky Moore, then? Less yes. receptions than Hardman? Yeah. No, no, not Hardman. Um, okay. MVS. I yeah, just MVS. don't – nothing about nothing about Juju – I think like throughout all my drafts so far, I think I'm about four or five percent on them. Uh -huh. I, I'm getting some targets on them, just you know, just because you don't want to get stuck. But I just I feel like last year was his chance. He signed the one year deal in Pittsburgh, and that was a disaster. Then he comes here on a one year deal. He's not getting paid any money. Of course, he could be Mahomes' favorite target, but I just don't like. I just don't like what I've seen from him lately. Last couple of years, he hasn't looked like the guy that was a dynasty dream a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. And now he's just – I feel like he's just on the tail end of his career, even though he's still young. But he's closer to being out of the league than he is leading 100 – people keep saying 100 receptions, 90 receptions. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. I'll have some shares just because you have to have shares of this offense. Mm -hmm. But he's not somebody I'm targeting. Okay, well, I don't think you're wrong about those other guys, but I think you're missing this one here. But we'll see. I sure like him a lot better, and I like Gabriel Davis's track record. I just want to go out well, there and say that. I'll take Gabriel Davis 100 times. I know you will. I know Listen, you will. Fellas, we're all going to get on the same conference call with Todd Burroughs in a month. Yes. We'll talk about Smith Schuster. We'll talk about here. Dobbins. We'll talk about it all. Um, Farrell, let me um, let me pose something to you that faced Roy Perenzuela and, and Corey Hanstein here, the FFPC Joes, at the 702 tonight. So they had um, they have no tight ends on their squad coming into the 702. Hussein the Brain Aksu from uh, Fantasy Couch doubles up on tight end with Zach Ertz in the sixth round. It comes to Perenzuela and Hanstein in the seventh round, knowing they don't have a tight end, knowing one team has already doubled up on tight end, knowing that if they pass on tight end here, they got to wait all the way to the end of the eighth round. What do you do in a scenario like that? whether you're drafting in football guys, whether you're drafting in the FFPC best ball tournament, how do you handle something like that when all of a sudden you realize, oh, man, all of a sudden tight end's more of a premium than I thought? I think they might have made a mistake because they they went for a fourth running back uh, in a tight end premium league. Now, so far it's paid off because only one tight end has gone off the board. Uh, and they probably have targeted – uh, red zone tight ends rather than reception tight ends. And they might like a couple of the younger guys like I do, uh, but you're going to have to draft them sometime. And, uh, you know, everybody else sees those players too. I think every team here wants three starting tight ends and there's not enough to go around. And uh, yeah, I would have wanted one tight end before I wanted that fourth running. All right, I want to welcome in our next guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen, uh, an, a best ball expert, a, a best ball seer. He's got the best ball crystal ball. He hosts the Run to Daylight podcast. You follow him on Twitter at Best Ball NFL. He's picking from the free spot tonight. We've had 
mostly good things to say about his draft. He's mostly. here to tell us why we're all wrong. I look forward to it right now. Todd Burroughs, welcome to the program, man. <laughs> there he is. Our fearless leader. <laughs> I, am, I, 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 uh, Buddha bless you. And, uh, Terp. Please bless that J.K. Dobbins pick. Damn good to see you, Terp. Good to see you, too. All right, so Todd, let these me guys have that. a little history, Balky. Uh, well, we, you we know, can, we can let we can let everybody in on that if we want to talk about Burroughs versus Terpoli here. We have a history. history. I thought we always got along great. I yeah, well, that God. could be your history, sir. Stick with that. <laughs> Develop around the, that. Narrative. The J.K. Dobbins thing. Did, start you, ever, did you ever realize that his story is history? And if you read the Bible, no. All right, go ahead. <laughs> we are this close to YouTube cutting off our feed right now, but I'm glad I'm glad you stopped yourself that. Okay, so let's talk about this. We obviously all loved your start uh, from from uh, from the three spot tonight, but then it turned a little bit. Now, okay, let me preface this: Were you looking at Goddard in the sixth round? Had Zuka not taken? Him oh yeah, three? I mean okay. that that that's easy money. I didn't really expect him to make it back to me, but you know, I I've n- I don't know Mike Zuka, but I keep hearing from. People I respect how how good he is. Yeah. And I trust guys like Dave Hubbard. When they say he's good, he's good. I mean, his ADP is 6'6 in Fantasy Mojo's most recent uh, ADP. So I didn't really expect him to make it to me. Um, But, you know, it still stings when, to me, he was clearly the guy that would have fit my team the best. Um, Dobbins is, uh, first of all, I'm a lot higher on Dobbins than most people. The guy is electric. We just heard that, um, he might miss the beginning of the season and he came right back on and was like, you know, kind of like F that I'm going to, I'm going to be here. Well, his ADP in the last five days, according to fantasy mojo is the middle of the fifth round. So for me to get him at 6'10", it was a pure value pick. And since I have McCaffrey and Aaron Jones, if he does, uh, he's a big spike week guy, which is hugely important in best ball. He's an electric player. So to get over a round of value on a guy that I like, based on some news that Ian Rappaport put out there, um, it to me was a no-brainer. Uh, by the way, as Fantasy Mojo is pointing out in Twitter right or in the YouTube chat right now, Michael Zuka not only took uh, a top five finish home in the FFPC main event, he won one of the live auctions out at Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas, and he yeah, also won. The I Fair never doubted Dallas. that he was yeah. good. It just, yeah. it, it no, just, I'm not calling you out. Yeah. I'm just for the YouTube, the, the stream viewers, just gotcha. showing Zuka had a great year in 2021. Yeah, and in and, defense of Dobbins, I believe and I like his dra- and I like his draft a lot. If you look yeah. at his team, he couldn't pass on Connor in the fourth for the same reason I felt I couldn't pass on Dobbins in the in the sixth. Your right. third, you get your third running back. It takes a lot of pressure off a position that's gonna, uh, um, you know, you're gonna run out of good running backs before you run out of good wide receivers, as Farrell uh, very rightly mentioned. Um, you know, and then he took Mooney, who who I love, I love, and um, I'm, I'm on there. the clock. So yeah, uh, a li- a little bit of a reach here. Um, I like this guy, whom about to take a tremendous amount. I think out of all the later tight ends, um, he has the best chance of being a top four or five guy, and that's Pat Fryermuth. Mm-hmm. Um, Big rookie so, year last year. Yeah, that's so I, I I really think that he is a guy who. His ADP should be a little higher than it is. I, a tight end, I didn't want to go any further without getting a good tight end. Um, so that, to me, that's when you the reach. You know, you? Sometimes you scoop value like Dobbins, and sometimes you reach a little bit. Uh, Todd, Terp, Terp was just pointing out, um, what about the Pittsburgh quarterback situation? Does that worry you at all with Friar Muth? It, it does to a certain extent, but you know what do uh, what do rookies and bad quarterbacks do? They drop off the ball a lot. Um, Fryermuth, you know, to me and see the other thing people I sometimes I think miss about um, point and a half tight end is it really is only good for guys who catch a lot of passes, right? 
And I think Fryer Muth is the type of guy who could give you 70, 80 catches, um, which is the equivalent of 105 at, um, at wide receiver. I, I, I don't think he's a huge big play guy like some of the other, like a Goddard, but I do think he's a good, he's going to have a good floor. He's going to catch, you know, four or five passes a week. And he'll give you a certain amount of touchdowns. It, it remains to be seen how many. And He's certainly- fantastic in the red zone, and he was in college. That's not something that was just incidental to last year. Fryer Muth is a better player inside the 20-yard line. He loves to compete, and he loves to get open. He knows how to do it. He looks like one of the more uh, seasoned veterans whenever Pittsburgh Steelers are in the red zone. You knew the ball was going to him, and you didn't know a lot about what Steelers were doing last year, but you knew that they were going to get the ball to fire. And the Steelers always seem to find a way to be. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I love the guy. Um, And and it was, uh, you know, I really wanted Pitts to fall to me, and when he didn't, Aaron Jones falling to me was fabulous. Um, And you you had to be holding your breath to – for him to get back to you, since I know, since I can tell how much you wanted this player throughout the seven and the eighth round in a tight end premium format, everybody wants three. There was only two drafted. I might have to rethink that. Maybe everyone doesn't want three, but congratulations. A good pick. Are you going to pick another tight end now? Um, Boy, there is one I like. Yeah. But I there's figured. another guy that I really like too at uh, the quarterback position. And that would kind of fill me up. I mean, they're my my two most owned quarterbacks in best ball right now are Russell Wilson and Dak Prescott. Yeah. But it, tight end's going to thin out quicker. I'm going to take Cole Komet, there and you, um, I, I think that th- those two guys together make up for not getting one of the top guys. All right, um, Todd. One of the other things you posted in the in the, was that the guy you were thinking of, Farrell? Yeah, he certainly is, and I have concerns about uh, Chicago Bears scoring um, the ball uh, from the quarterback. It was it was rough last year, uh, but you cannot expect this player to turn in a goose egg with touchdowns, and I'm right there with his receptions. He'll trail Friar Muth, but not by much in, in receptions. Yeah, and 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 last year, you know, again, people forget Jimmy Graham was still there last year, man, and, target, and, he, and he's not now. Mm-hmm. Um, Todd, one of the things that you you posted in the in the YouTube chat earlier was you don't care about stacking in this format. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know you've done a ton of best ball drafts, and and I'm just curious what your thoughts on stacking in this particular format. Well, this is an isolated league with one prize, right? And there is an advantage to stacking even still. But, um, you know, I think that Jalen Hurts, you know, I I think I could have easily taken Jalen Hurts. But the Dobbins value to me, maybe he would have made it back. Maybe he wouldn't have. But I felt like if Hurts didn't make it back, it wasn't much of a drop off to Russ. And so that's kind of the mental math that you're doing in your head when you're on the clock. Um, I feel the drop off at running back. I mean, look at who went after Dobbins in the sixth. Mm -hmm. The next guy was Clyde Edwards Hilaire and then Miles Sanders and Kareem Hunt, guys who are not, you know, real A's with big upside week to week. Um, So, you know, I, 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 I took a chance that I could slip Hurts through, but I felt like Wilson would not be bad behind it. Um, uh, there is an advantage to stacking, but it isn't something in a solo league. It's much more important in a tournament where you need to advance each week than it is in a solo league. Uh, Todd, I don't have anything else for you. I, I, you've been very, very gracious with your time here during the draft. Farrell, Terp, is there anything else you'd like to ask uh, Todd about his team from the three slot before we let him go? Always a pleasure. Who's the quarterback? Who's the, well, no, you don't want to tell me that. You can't oh, tell me that. Well, he's, you don't he's, know gone, he's gone already. I, I would have, yeah. he went the next next pick. It, it was Dak. Oh, you were choosing between me and Dak. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, Dak, Dak to me, Dak and Wilson are my two highest stone quarterbacks. Both of them have top three upside. Both of them are going in the six to 12 range. I, I love that range. And, uh, I just felt that I I really needed a tight end there, second tight end. 
Uh, Todd, we appreciate you um, coming on the podcast tonight. Uh, awesome stuff as always. Very insightful, very informative. We all follow you at Best Ball NFL on Twitter. Uh, good luck not only in this draft, but in all your other teams this year, man. We always appreciate it. It's having always you. an honor to be invited. You know, th this one never gets old. And uh, I want to thank Mojo and the people at FFPC. Love the format. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Todd. Be good. Enjoy the rest of the draft, man. Have a good one, man. Todd Burroughs, ladies and gentlemen. The Todd at Best Ball NFL on Twitter. Guys, I don't want to totally flip the script from Todd's team, but we probably should talk about what Peter Overzet from uh, Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life is doing in the seven spot tonight. Starts off tight end running back in Kelsey and DeAndre Swift. And then out of his next eight picks, am I reading that right? No, seven picks. He goes with a receiver in all of them. Terp, what do you make of this strategy? And, and bear in mind, he got Trey Lance in the eighth round, which could be a cheat code this year. Follows it up with a stack in getting Brandon Ayuk in the ninth round. Exceptional, exceptional draft. I can't say much negative about it. He got a gift with DeAndre Swift falling where it fell and, and just getting Lance who in my opinion could be an easily a top five mm -hmm. upside play this year. And then getting Ayuk fine, like right behind it, a cheap stack. You didn't have to overpay for him. Like in some, you know, drafts that you see Judy's a good value in the fifth. I'm not a juju guy, but some people are, so that's not bad in the sixth. You're not getting him any later than that. Drake London's going to be a target guy. It's really hard not to love his draft. I mean, he's definitely in the top one or two, maybe three in this whole league so far. So what does he do at running back now the rest of the way is we're almost halfway through and he only has one running back. He doesn't really like taking running backs. Based but don't you, you have to. Backs. You have to. I don't care I'm, if you like it or not. You've got to do it at some He'll point. get some. He'll get a bunch. He'll get a bunch of Madisons and so that, in your opinion, White. that's what he's going to do. He's going to start pounding all these one injury away type guys, right? He's going to get a bunch of guys like that and just hope an RB2 emerges. And if it does, he's probably going to win the league. He's going to have to have an RB1 perhaps emerge if, you know, if he's playing Russian roulette with the injury situation. And I agree that DeAndre Swift is a wonderful present. And then it was like he, he thought he would get gag gifts if he went back to running back again. And he's got Juju Smith-Schuster here, a guy you don't like, as his fourth receiver and then the rookie London um as um as his fifth receiver when there was a lot of really good running backs on the board and and you know I love London uh, who doesn't that's in the scouting business think but what running backs would you take over London it, um well I, what I'm saying is he is the fifth receiver uh, is that's fair if you go to we love Michael Pittman Michael Pittman caught 41 balls uh, in his rookie year uh, mm -hmm. before he became the player that he did become. If you take a look at what's going on in Atlanta, uh, quarterback, offensive coordinator, system, offense, offensive line, it's hard to imagine that Drake London is just going to run free and catch a lot of balls. No, I, I at some point in time, he would have been uh, judicious to pick another running back. Just one more running back, and I like this a little better. I believe that the least important player in fantasy football is your second string running back. But uh, Rashad White just went bulky. What running back is that? RB. Rashad, yeah, it's 37. He's a 37. RB 37, you know, and uh, let, let me tell you, it's getting a little thin down here. It's getting ugly right now. I mean, looking at the guys who are still available, he's – Probably going to have well, to take one here uh, and maybe well, the well, next guys, round and maybe the next round, but no, he won't take one here. Not after uh, that. Uh, well, okay. But, but let's talk about this a little bit. Farrell, I'm totally with you on like when I'm uh, maybe not best ball, but like, especially when I'm playing KFFSC main event or any other format where it's like start two or three receivers, a couple of flexes, whatever. I'm with you. I think the the I'm not really focused on my second running back, right? Unless mm -hmm. an insane value falls to me. I'll figure that out throughout the regular season. Now he does go with James Cook here, a pass catching running back from, from Buffalo. So there is something to be said for that. But I think as, as far as trying to win the whole thing, if you assemble a good core of receivers with an elite tight end, which he has in Travis Kelsey, with an elite starting running or number one running back in Swift, and then getting a, a potential cheat code quarterback in Trey Lance. If you get, if you hit on one of these late round running backs, doesn't that make you a lot more likely to win this league with that type of team structure? 
Uh, perhaps it does, but you, you're asking him to, that he must hit on a double-digit running back, and he's got to he hit takes a bunch of them, right? And I mean, he's got to hit them consistently through the season. Okay, now they've right, got to yeah. get their opportunity. You mentioned Madison; he's got to get an opportunity to play. Some of these other, you know, Jamal Cooks in the same way. You know, the, the veteran running backs in that backfield are just not going to stand aside to to let him play, nor is coaching staff. Um, my point is that um, it, it, the cost of picking up another running back um, does certainly does not exceed the price that he he had to pay. He had to pay a lot. I, I could find. I think if we were together and look at this, I could find a lot of receivers down here in the double digit rounds that'll catch as many, if not more, balls than Drake London. That's where his running back, I think, should have come from. Uh, Henry Mudo chiming in. Oh, by the way, Henry Mudo, who um, uh, drafted last night in pros versus Joe's, chiming in, uh, saying that Pete took one running back in the first nine, nine rounds. That's more than normal. We can talk, <laughs> listen. We can talk. He's about a big Pete. zero running back guy. I, and I get. Better. And listen, we can talk about Pete Overzet's draft. We can talk about his strategy. We can pontificate on what he's thinking. I have a better solution. Let's talk to the man himself. You follow him, him on here. Twitter at Peter Overzet from Matthew Berry's Fantasy Land, bringing him into the broadcast right now. It's Peter Overzet from the seven spot. Pete, what's up, man? Legend. Yeah, my ears were burning. I had to come in here and tell <laughs> Farrell he's full of shit. And I'm, I'm crushing Thank this. You. And uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's good to be here as always. Always a fun time. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're, we're thrilled that you're on. You had to be thrilled that DeAndre Swift fell to you in the second round, right? Yeah, I, I was. I was, you know, when I got the seven slot, I kind of assumed Kelsey wasn't going to be there. I kind of thought I was going to end up going Stefan Diggs there uh, just because I don't love those running backs in the first round. But Swift and Barkley were my two targets there in the second round after getting Kelsey. So had my choice there, kind of flipping coins. I like both of those guys ended up going Swift. And then once I started tight end and running back, I knew I was going to be pissing yellow here for a while. <laughs> yeah, and, and and I and you did, and like it, it, Moore, Johnson, Judy, Smith, Schuster, Drake, London. W do you have a favorite among those receivers from from three to seven? Do you feel like you got the best value on any of those guys? I mean, I know you like the value on all of them, but who was your favorite of of those between Moore, Johnson, Judy, JJSS, and London? Yeah, it was actually, you know, I would say a lot of these guys that I took aren't my favorite just within their ADP pockets, but I was just kind of grabbing the bottom of the tiers. Like, obviously, I would have preferred, you know, A.J. Brown and Higgins to D.J. Moore. I would have grabbed Mike Williams there instead of Deontay Johnson. I would have grabbed uh, Metcalf, I think, if he fell there. So, yeah, I was kind of getting my my consolation prices, but uh, prizes. But then I think things swung around. Drake London and getting that Brandon Ayuk backdoor stack with Lance mm -hmm. Um, felt, felt pretty good there. And then James cook felt a little bit like a gift. I was, I was kind of torn because I was going to scoop Singletary and even pass on the IU stack if he fell there to me, but then kind of getting James cook as, you know, kind of the arbitrage on Singletary there. I kind of like how that shook out ultimately. What, um, when you, uh, when you look at the remainder of this draft, we know you love drafting receivers. Do you, are, are you going to have to grit your teeth and, and uh, pound a bunch of green here and get a bunch of running backs the rest of the way? Or are you going to continue to look at the receiver position? Don't yeah, do it, no. Pete. Don't do it. Stay so yellow. here's the thing. I, I am ready yellow. To, I'm ready to start vomiting green, but if there is a receiver, uh, there's one receiver that I will take if he's still here when I pick. But uh, otherwise, yeah, yeah we're going to start ripping uh, some vomiting, some green picks here. Pete, is Trey Lance your pick to win in this format? And we talked about all night how you got to draft or you got to get first place in this league. Otherwise, you win nothing. Is Lance the type of pick to win player that you made here? If, if this wasn't a, you know, one out of 12 wins, would you have gone for a different quarterback there? Yeah. I mean, that. So what was going through my head there was there was that run and there goes my guy. I would have taken Garrett Wilson uh, mm. if he didn't go here to uh, brotofantasy.com. But um, once I saw that that side of the board, you know, eight through 12 had all taken their first quarterback. Um, I, I was getting a little bit of an itchy finger here. I will take Ronald Jones and build out my, uh, my chief. Oh, there we go. Here. Um, a lot but, of vomit here. No, here, no yeah, we're going to anymore. It's all vomit, vomit and green. And Peter <laughs> yeah. You heard it here first. 
but I was uh, I was getting a little panicky singing that quarterback room. I definitely like prioritizing an elite quarterback, and I do think Lance is going to be part of that tier. But once I saw that that side of the board had all taken their first QBs, I thought it was very unlikely that one of them kind of double tapped their second quarterback that early. So I kind of knew I had the London luxury pick and that Lance would probably fall back to me there, and that's what happened. So I, I like how the board fell there. So I'm Peter Overzet from Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. You follow him on Twitter at Peter Overzet. Pete, when when you're talking about this format here, um, again, where one team wins it all, how does this? How does your strategy in this format vary as opposed to when you're drafting just a a best ball tournament where you're trying to beat hundreds or thousands of other players? Yeah, I would say this. I think I if this was just an FFPC 125 league, mm-hmm. I think in the board was like this. I, I can't really think of anything I would have done differently up to this point um because it is a a first or last thing i kind of approach it from the same kind of tournament mentality here and i I do just structurally like getting that elite tight end that elite anchor running back that elite quarterback and then it kind of really opens you up um to do whatever you want uh elsewhere so i i I don't really think there's much i would do different in a regular 125 league this is just kind of how i prefer to attack this where second place gets you nothing i know are you going to take your elite quarterback Oh, Farrell with he the has one. here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm on the Lance team this year. I just had to get that in there. And you know what? After you didn't pick a receiver, everyone else said, you know what? There's no receivers left. Overset stopped picking them. They all went away. <laughs> well, that's sometimes how, running back. sometimes that's how it works, and it's nice, right? Because you'll be yeah. pissing yellow hardcore, and then when everyone starts grabbing theirs, then you get some of these running yeah. back values. Like I would I would consider Cook and, and Ronald Jones. I'd have to check the ADPs, but I'm pretty sure both those guys slid a little past ADP as people kind of tried to recover at wide receiver. Yeah, I'm just looking at it right now between um, – between, uh, uh, James. well, let's – just kick it off here. James Cook normally um, 9.03. You get him in the mid-10th tonight, uh, Pete, so that was a value there. And then obviously Ronald Jones, um, his ADP is normally uh, actually the 11.06, so you got him right right about on brand um, tonight for, for Ronald Jones, so I, I totally get that. Had Kelsey been taken, Pete, um, and, and knowing that you wanted an elite tight end early, let's say Pitts and Andrews weren't available to you in the second, how would this have been different? Would you have reached for Waller would you have would you have taken Schultz earlier how would you have done that you know what um it was interesting I would have been really praying I would have gone Diggs in the first and then I would have prayed Pitts would have fell he would have gone one before me then Mm -hmm. I would have prayed Waller fell he would have gone two before me and I would have ultimately have quote-unquote reached for Kittle there in the mid-third I I don't think I would have left that round without Kittle okay all right Uh, dave turp believes that juju smith schuster is not really a kansas city chief contributor this year yet you took him kind of where i've been taking him your thoughts on schuster's productivity can you give us some numbers yeah i actually don't even mind that take i think cost adjusted i i like sky more in mbs Mm -hmm. um this was another one of those things where i've made a bet on the chiefs here with uh with Travis Kelsey, I'm gonna have to pay attention here and see what I am going to do on the board with my uh my next pick. But I have a few running back options I like here. Let's see. I'll I'll, I'll give you guys a, a celebrity pick. Who should I take? Should I take uh Michael Carter or Darrell Henderson? You guys get to choose. Terp, what do you think, Carter or Henderson here? Henderson. Henderson, Farrell. What about you? Um, you know what. I'm going to say Carter just because Terp oh, said. God, so I All right, Paul, you got to break the tie. All right, I knew this was going to happen. All right, and so I, I'm 60% in Henderson in most of my teams. But, yeah, here I'm going to take All it. All right, so we've been getting a lot of guests on the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour within the last month talking about Daryl Henderson. So I will say Daryl Henderson here because a lot of people smarter than me that have a lot more skin in the game than me have been saying Henderson. I'll say Henderson here to break All the right, tie. Henderson Reluctantly breaking the tie. I didn't want to have to do that, and I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> how many how many people come on here and let the panel make their picks for him? Yeah. You're you guys, the first I mean, ever. This this is yeah. the first ever time yeah, that we've like... we've ever had uh, um a um a group think pick um on on the well of course we norm we normally don't have three hosts. We're lucky to have three hosts tonight, Pete. So it's very exciting for that. But that's next awesome. time next time come before you pick quarterback. We'll help you better. Oh, okay, yeah. No, this is it, it was actually it was my way of getting you guys in my pocket because now you can't trash my team because you guys no. literally helped draft oh. it. So now I'm now I'm in the clear. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so downvote all our tweets about Pete <laughs> Overzet's horrible pros versus Joe's draft. Um, when we talk about it tomorrow um, on uh, on the uh, interwebs, Pete, we have kept you way too long. You've been very gracious with your time. We appreciate you uh, you popping aboard. We will follow you on Twitter at Peter Overzet. Congratulations with everything you have going on, including with Fantasy Life. We we uh, we're we're very thankful that uh, you were able to pop aboard tonight. Good luck the rest of the way, dude. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we're going to be drafting a ton of main event teams on ship chasing coming up in August, doing some of our slows now, and uh, we're going to be posting our schedule soon. So, yeah, August is going to be FFPC season over on ship chasing. So thanks for having me, guys. Love it. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate it. it. Main event season. I love it with the FFPC on ship chasing. Guys, uh, you, you know why I say Carter? Normally that way, but I love hearing it out loud. Go ahead, Farrell. Do you know why I say Carter? Because I'm trying. I was trying to save Henderson for team number two. I, Farrell, I thought, why are you you do you have stakes in these FFPC Joe? No, because team number two looks like well, something I might have drafted without oh. the tenth and eleventh pick. So I was just trying to save him for that. <laughs> that team. There's another Ram. He got another Ram. So yeah, he Higby as the second tight end taken by Perenzuela and Hanstein. And I know I, and Corey was in the YouTube chat last night, and I should have asked him then. Hey, is it Hanstein or Hanstein? And I've said it both ways. I'm trying to balance it out tonight, whether it's Hanstein or Hanstein. So I know I'm butchering it half the time, but at least I'm getting it right half the time. Oh, uh, let's talk about that. Perenzuela and uh, Hanstein not taking a tight end until round 11, still ending up with Okuwepanaum and Higby. Terp, what do you think about that when you wait 10 rounds um, and you pass on the position and then you get those two in 11 and 12? I'm a big weight on the tight end guy, um, but... I don't think they're the guys I'm going to wait on. I think they waited too long. Um, they could have moved up a little bit. Cole Clement, who we know on this show, I said is going to be a top five, top five tight end this year, in my opinion. Would have been a better fit. Irv Smith would have been a better fit. Even guys like Noah Fant. Those two guys are okay, but I just feel like you're going to be behind. You're going to be way behind the eight ball when it comes to some of these elite tight ends and even these second tier options that. Team two is not a team that I like at all. Okay. All right. Um, well, we, we might be butting heads on that, or at least you and Farrell will be butting heads on. The we seem to be doing that a lot. Also, yeah. real quick, I want to interrupt you real quick. Go ahead. To make a, I want to make a bet live on this feed right now. Last all right. Night I heard the feed, and you said Robert Woods would be the number one tight end in, in Tennessee. Number one receiver. Number, number one, receiver. one receiver, correct. I am going to take the rookie, Mr. Burks, mm-hmm. for a nice steak dinner. In Vegas. In, in Kentucky, As Balky in Vegas. and the okay. Dizzle would say, you have five on it, Terp, and I will let you pick the location. And we'll have it. The bet is good. I should have that audio. I don't have that audio anymore, unfortunately, so I can't play it. But Luna's hashtag Luna's. I got five on it. Or in this case, very nice steak dinner out in Las Vegas. So yeah, fantastic. Um, Farrell, Alexander Madison and Isaiah Spiller went back to back here in the 12th round. Um uh, uh, Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell taking Spiller, and then uh, Alexander Madison going to Josh and Laura Durham. Do you have a favorite uh, out of those two? If it were you on the clock between Madison and Spiller, guys who are counting on injuries um, to the starter to have fantasy value this year, do you have a favorite between Spiller and Madison? Um, I see those guys as is is truly handcuffs, and Spiller wouldn't have been available there for me. If I was, if I had uh, Eckler, which was his team six, that's where I would have taken, I would have taken Spiller just, just to see what that might look like and how that's going to look differently in the red zone. And Madison, you know, Madison's a player when he plays, but they, uh, they're not going to take Cook off the field for him to get that volume. So, you know, that's, you know, Madison went to his handcuffs, Spiller did not. And that's about all I got to say about that. That's where their utility in this draft format lives i think um alex polanco in the uh youtube chat right now saying that he can't see the board because he's watching uh this on his phone right now he said it'd be great if we did a round walkthrough at the end of every round so dedicated to alex we're going to try to do that the remainder of the draft and we'll start with round 12 here kj osborne to brian harris isaiah spiller as you just heard to patrick and mcdowell alexander madison to josh and laura Durham, jahan dotson the rookie Going to John Hansen again, shooting for the stars here. He gets Sky Moore in the uh, in the tenth round, who I know he's high on, and then he gets Jahan Dotson in the twelfth. Michael Gallup over to Julio Fuentes coming off the ACL surgery. 
Uh, he gets him uh, here. Daryl Henderson, you heard that pick live on the air from Peter Overzet. Rondale Moore to Mike Zuka. Christian Watson to Jason Petropoulos, followed by Robert Tunyon, Watson's real-life teammate in Green Bay, to Michael Apt. Michael Carter to uh, Todd Burroughs, followed by Tyler Higby to Perrins, Whale, and Hanstein, and then Tua Tungabailoa to Fantasy Couch. That is Hussein Aksu, the uh, Hussein the Brain, picking Tua Tungabailoa at the end of the 12th. Terp, would you be okay with Tua Tungabailoa as your number one quarterback if you hit tight end twice and pounded the running backs and receivers in the first 11 rounds? No. I feel like there's just so many better options. There's so many questions with Tua. Yeah, he has Waddle. Yeah, he has Tyreek. All the weapons are there, but is he really any good? You keep hearing these puff pieces. Tyreek Hill comes out today and says another new slogan that people are taking and going crazy with. I think two is a, a good number two with upside, but to lead your team on a team that, no offense, really isn't that great. <laughs> Not mincing words. Turf, what if I told you that you could get Jameis Winston with your very next pick? Then would you be okay with it? No, probably not. <laughs> I can't sell him. I can't sell him. Yeah. I mean, Turf is set on that. I would probably take Daniel Jones over both of them, but. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, now that's surprising to me as well. What? Why do you like Daniel? Okay, so I get it over Tug of Iloa, but why do you like Daniel Jones over Jameis Winston? It's all about the new coaching staff. Daniel Jones has talent. He has rushing upside. I mean, he was in the disaster of disaster with, with Jason Garrett. No Barkley. They have plenty of weapons. Yeah, Tony's a little bit of a, a nut job. You would think new coaching staff, they paid Kenny Gall, they had a ton of money. They're going to get start figuring out a way to get him the ball. I like the rookie they drafted out of Kentucky, Wondell Robinson. Sterling Shepard's still around there. I just think this new coaching staff is going to figure out a way to get Daniel Jones. He's not Josh Allen anywhere close to him, but if he's a mini Josh Allen, he, the Giants, in my opinion, being an Eagles fan, are the biggest challenge to the Eagles this year. Uh, that being that being said, I've 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 been curious who's going to stand up and beat the drum for Daniel Jones. I'm glad to hear you doing it, Terp, but. And, and from time to time, I feel the same way, but none of the giant players are moving up the board. Am I correct about this? No. Galladay is stuck where Galladay is stuck. In the middle of the ninth round has been Tony uh, all year long. There's there's no um, – the, the, they're, they're a little wanting at tight end. I agree with you. There's some players that can play there, and Robinson is a good player from here at the University of Kentucky. So mm – -hmm. Yeah, I feel that there. I feel that there's hope there. You know, I will point out that Winston and and Tua are experiencing new coaching situations too. That's correct. And there's a lot of uh, there. There's a lot of uh, Winston to 14, uh, 14 touchdowns and three interceptions before he went on the IR last year. They have so, a ton of weapons in, this, in New Orleans too. Yeah. Um, if Michael Todd, Thomas has his head on straight, right, which is a um, big if. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Todd Burrow is um, our our guest earlier in the program, the first hour tonight, pointing out in the YouTube chat that uh, he likes the Giants as really good values this year. Um, Tony hasn't moved up so much, but Barkley has actually moved up quite a bit, and I can I can sign off on that. Barkley started off very very low, and he was um, a third round pick early on, right? And and I was talking with um, uh, Real Talk Raff and Josh Hayes on the Rotorballer uh, Series XM Fantasy Sports Radio Show. Uh, a few weeks ago, and and Terp uh, and Farrell, I talked about the glamour shots, or Raph called them glamour shots, of Saquon Barkley that started circulating Twitter. And all of a sudden, Barkley's status and <laughs> ADP started going up like, oh, my God, he's got quads and abs. He's a first-round pick. Um, mm -hmm. Let's get into uh, the 13th round here, guys. We already talked about Hux, uh, Hussein Aksu taking uh, James Winston with the first pick of the 13th round. Austin Hooper, the third straight tight end, drafted by Perenzuela and Hanstein there. Uh, following by our going Oku up and now Tyler Higby, and then followed by Austin Hooper here. I like that pick uh, in the uh, 13th round. Jacoby Myers to Todd Burroughs, David and Joku again, the third straight tight end drafted by Michael Apt here to go with Gerald Everett and Robert Tunyon. Bunch of running backs here then JD McKissick to Jason Petropolis from Brodo Fantasy, Kenneth Gainwell to Mike Zuka, Tyler Allgaier to mm -hmm. Peter Overzet as his fourth straight running back, pounding the running backs like that pick there as well for Overzet. Jalen Tolbert, the rookie, uh, goes to uh, Julio Fuentes here in the eight spot. Matt Jones backing up Joe Burrow. 
John Hansen, Evan Engram, and Hayden Hurst. A couple of tight ends off the board next. Uh, Engram to Josh and Laura Durham. Uh, Hayden Hurst off the board to uh, Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell. And then Van Jefferson completes the uh, the the uh, round here 13 as Jefferson goes to Brian Harris. Terp, what do you make of Van Jefferson this year? Does he have standalone value if Cup and Robinson are healthy all year? I think he's a great pick in a best ball format. Um, he's definitely a guy that's going to have some spike weeks. I mean, they have so many weapons with with Cup and Robinson, and Higby at tight end will be solid. The running backs will be okay. Uh, Akers should, hopefully, if he's 100%, take the next step to get back to where he was last year, which was a late first-round pick before the injury. Um, I think he definitely is a good you know, best ball pick. He definitely is an injury away from being probably five, six rounds earlier. If not, and he's 100% healthy. There was reports that came out this week that he wasn't healthy last year, and he still had a pretty solid season for, you know, what it was. That can only go up, especially if Matthew Stafford, year two in the offense. The Rams could be scary this year. They're by far, in my opinion, the NFC favorite. Um, Tyler Allgaier, Farrell, we've been talking about this guy even, even before the NFL draft. We saw the piece come out today about, I don't know what beat writer it was for the Falcons saying that he has a good shot to be the starting running back. I would imagine that that's going to bump his ADP up until training camp. But what do you make of Algaier here in the in the 13th round for overs that squad? I think the guys fell asleep and and let um, and let overset get him. I look at um, uh, I look at a team here that already had Singletary, and they then pick up the clone McKissick. And I I love both those those running backs, but I would like to have some differentiation in the skill set and the utility. Um, of the players and you know so so I think that would I think Tyler uh, gets more touches in the rushing mix there in Atlanta so consequently I would have preferred him over the other two uh, guys which I think are situational backs and third down backs so I yeah I slid into something very nicely there um all right so we are did I go through? The yeah, I went through the 13th round here. The last thing I'll mention and, and Terp, I'll I'll throw this to you. Um, we talked about Antonio Gibson, and I think Jared Smola was talking about what a value he is in fantasy drafts right now. I think he tweeted that out either yesterday or today. Um, and obviously they drafted Brian Robinson, but JD McKissick goes to Jason Petropolis here. What do you make of McKissick this year, knowing that he'll never be the guy in our nation's capital? but he will catch a lot of passes there. And this is full PPR for running backs. He definitely will never be the guy, but clearly they love him to, they brought him back. They paid him some money. And for whatever reason, they don't like Antonio Gibson. People saying he's a value right now. I love the player. I just Mm -hmm. hate the fit. Mm -hmm. Brian Robinson, Mm -hmm. you know, they drafted him. He's a big guy, probably going to be the goal line guy. I mean, you don't know. I mean, Carson Wentz is obviously still a question. So there's, so many questions in Washington right now. Uh, Antonio Gibson, the fifth round is too rich for me. I would rather take a shot on a McKissick in this type of format than draft Gibson in the fifth round. Well, I really up. like what I really like what this team number uh, team eight is doing, though. Uh, especially after they went quarterback and after they went Gibson, and then when you we've been talking about stacks all night and. It, this, this is a favorite one for me, Gallup and Tolbert down here. I especially once Gallup returns healthy, I really like what those two wide receivers can do. No one's really talking about the CD Lamb, uh, the, the other receivers that are in that offense, mm-hmm. and I, I love it. And I Tony think, Pollard, so yeah, you got three guys. I, I think they all benefit from having su- such an excellent quarterback and such a, um, a vibrant offense, but man, oh man, those. Those are guys at the double-digit rounds that can flirt with uh, 60 and 800, uh, perhaps up to 1,000 uh, yards uh, receiving. It's it's just a very good draft for Team 8 with what they've done at the receiver position. Michael Gallup's a great value in the 12th round, especially with so much unknown. Is is he going to be ready for the season? Is he not? He misses a couple games. I mean, he's the clear number two with no more Amari Cooper. To get a guy that realistically, if he was healthy, probably goes, where does Michael Gallup go if he's 100%? Yeah. You could probably say he goes up in the St. Brown, Godwin, Juju, Elijah yeah. Moore area. Maybe. Right, right around there, I would say. I yeah. don't think it's crazy. Maybe even no. higher. 
I, I, w- I was going to say fifth round, and you're talking about guys who normally go in like the, the early sixth, late fifth. So I think that seems about right for Gallup. He's there. worth he's the risk in this format. He'll always be worth the risk. I all, I, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I wonder what Julio Fuentes would have done or what he was thinking if he would have known the Cowboys he could get here, Pollard in the eighth, um, Michael Gallup in the 12th, Jalen Tolbert in the 13th. He took Kyler Murray in the sixth. Maybe he grabs somebody else there. Or maybe he takes Kareem Hunt in the sixth, and then it's taken instead of taking Kareem Hunt in the seventh, he grabs Dak Prescott, and now you have this Uber Cowboy stack there too, which I think would be very, very interesting for fantasy purposes. Let's talk about the 14th round here and, and round this up, guys. Uh, Brian Harris takes Devontae Parker, his fourth straight receiver. Joshua Palmer going to Patrick and McDowell, followed by Deshaun Watson, the third quarterback taken by Josh and Laura Durham from the 10 slot tonight. Jamison Williams to John Hansen. Uh, Mark Ingram off the board to Julio Fuentes. And then we get a trio of quarterbacks here. Trevor Lawrence to Peter Overzet, which got some applause from uh, the YouTube chat room saying that was a good deal for Trevor Lawrence there at the seventh spot here in the 14th round. Daniel Jones to Mike Zuka. Zach Wilson to uh, Jason Petropoulos to back up Patrick Mahomes. Marlon Mack goes to Michael Apt, uh, Golden Sack, the former football guy's overall players' championship champion. Uh, Tyrion Davis-Price goes to Todd Burroughs. And then you have McCole Hardman to Perrins, Will, and Hanstein. And then Matt Ryan is the third consecutive quarterback drafted by Hussein Aksu. After not taking a quarterback in the first 11 rounds, he has gone to Atunga Bailoa, James Winston, and now Matt Ryan. Um, Farrell, what do you do with Deshaun Watson, knowing everything that, that we talked about on our show knowing everything that is is facing him, knowing everything that he's got past and everything that's behind him now. Deshaun Watson, the third quarterback for Josh and Laura Durham here in the 10 spot. What do you do with Watson in best ball drafts? Uh, with Deshaun Watson, well, this team doesn't do anything else with quarterback. And, you know, he's too tempting to have that player there. Uh, they spent a lot of draft capital on quarterbacks. If they thought – if they were targeting him – then I probably would have uh, searched for a tight end where I drafted Carr. Because, yeah, Watson's going to be available. Uh, this is about where he goes. They could have gone another round early uh, to get him. I, Yeah, he's a great player to have on this team, but they're way too heavy in quarterback where they don't necessarily need to be. Oh, I just like what they did there, though. Yeah, I know you like Alec Pierce for sure. It mm-hmm. seems like you like – so, Farrell, I know you like Alec Pierce. You like Michael Pittman. Do you like Matt Ryan this year then as well? Oh, sure. And he, okay. he's just a big, big, big bargain. I don't want to I don't want to play him in, in any other format other than this. And, and, you know, in a lot of the leagues that we drafted earlier, you know, he's on the waiver wire if you need a quarterback. Um, let's get to do the uh, 15th round here. After Aksu got three straight quarterbacks, he gets – Khalil Herbert as a uh, running back here in the 15th round. Ryan Tannehill, the third quarterback chosen by Perrins, Whale and Hanstein. DJ Chart to Todd Burrows. And then Gus Edwards, the uh, Baltimore Ravens running back to Michael App. Logan Thomas to Jason Petropoulos. Brevin Jordan is the selection by Mike Zuka here in the 15th round. Deontay Foreman goes to Peter Overs at Carson Wentz goes to Julio Fuentes. George Pickens taken by John Hansen. Then you have Jamal Williams and Daryl Williams, the Williams brothers, not related, off the board here as uh, Jamal goes to Josh and Laura Durham. Daryl goes to Patrick and McDowell. Davis Mills completes the 15th round here uh, as the second quarterback taken by Brian Harris. The thing I wanted to ask you, Terp, here as I look at the 15th round and I lost my spot here. Oh, Terp, I know what I was going to ask you. I'm seeing more and more teams draft three quarterbacks in this format. If you don't take a Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, one of those guys, are you looking for three quarterbacks in, in your team construction? It depends on who. Like we just, he just talked about, you know, he, he just talked about Deshaun Watson. To me, it's just a complete wasted pick. Ooh. Let's just say eight, eight rounds or they get suspended eight games, hypothetically. Okay. What's the best he's going to give you? Is he really outscored Derek Carr and Lamar Jackson to get you that many more points to be relevant? He's not. So to me, it's just, I mean, this guy's had a very, very good drift. I love the Evan Ingram pick, Hunter Henry, but the Sean Washington just really killed the flow a little bit. He did pick it up with two solid picks afterwards. But like Tua, we talked about, Jameis Winston, Matt Ryan. In my opinion, you got to draft a fourth. I don't like doing it, but – 
do you really who do you have confidence in there? Matt Ryan is probably the guy I have the most confidence in. Right. Out of the three. Um Farrell, we have talked a lot about Amon Ross St. Brown and um Jameson Williams on the high stakes fantasy football over. The one Lions receiver we haven't chatted and rapped about was Todd Burrow's pick here in the 15th round at the 1503 and DJ chart. What does he bring to the table for not only Burroughs here as a late round best ball pick, but for anybody drafting in the FFPC, anybody drafting in the KFFSC draft masters as a late round pick? It sounds like a cop out and maybe it is, but I'm staring clear of all Detroit Lions uh, with the exception of Mr. Swift. I've even soured a bit on Hawkinson. I'm not a big believer uh, in the quarterback. I'm not a big believer in the style of football that they play there. However, um, they have some games which which they do flash and they do compete in. But I I think we're, uh, you know, we're in the 15th round. Sure, if you like that, that's fine with me. But I'm, I'm not uh, – this is probably my least favorite team for fantasy contributors outside of Swift. 16th round, almost complete. Let's go through it, uh, everybody. Brian Harris taking Nico Collins to lead things off. Sammy Watkins, the new Green Bay Packer, going to Patrick and McDowell. Alec Pierce, you heard Farrell already com uh, comment on that, to Josh and Laura Durham. Brian Robinson, uh, another rookie, to John Hansen. Just looking at this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Am I seeing this right, guys? Seven rookies on John yep. Hansen's team? We're going to have to talk about that in a little bit. Matt Breida to uh, Julio Fuentes. Baker Mayfield, Terps' favorite quarterback, going to Peter Overzet. Jared Goff, the third quarterback chosen by Mike Zuka. Mo Ali Cox, the third tight end, taken by Jason Petropoulos from BrotoFantasy.com. Corey Davis to Michael Apt. Robbie Anderson to Todd Burroughs. Kendrick Bourne to Perenzuela and Hanstein. And then Kyle Rudolph completing round 16 to Hussein Aksu from the Fantasy Couch, fantasycouch.com. Farrell, we heard the uh, report uh, earlier today from a Tampa beat writer. Rudolph might occupy the majority of the Gronk role here in Tampa. How does that change things for you? Does it change things, or is this just something you say here in late July if you're a beat mm -hmm. reporter? Late July talk, but we we can stand by what we said about Rudolph Friday night and last night. I would want to get him on my team and where he's uh, – being chosen here just because of his elite uh, red zone skills, but he's going to be my th third tight end uh, in this format. Uh, Terp, the first pick of the 16th round tonight was uh, Nico Collins. We already um, talked about the bad news for John Metching, and hopefully he gets better soon with the, the leukemia diagnosis he received. How does that affect Nico Collins for you on your draft boards this year, knowing that Metching will probably miss the majority, if not all, of the 2022 season for the Texans? It only enhances me because I love Nico Collins. He's my third overall highest owned receiver so far. I just thought he was just way underlooked. I mean, did he have a spectacular rookie season? No. But you were you're banking on Brandon Cooks, obviously being the star, which I mean he he deserves that. Jordan is an unknown tight end who I do like. And then the guy coming off a bad injury, you know, from Alabama, Michi, obviously just terrible news we heard the other day. I just feel like you, you can do no wrong with him where he's being drafted. I thought he would go higher personally, mm -hmm. but I mean, who else is there? Who else is there that has any worry to, to, I mean, obviously somebody might emerge and somebody might, you know, come out of nowhere like there is every year, but Davis Mills is not a terrible quarterback. Mm -hmm. And to Very me, true. Nico Collins, the value where you're getting him, you can really do no wrong. with him. He's the best pick in that round by a good margin. Um, yeah, guys, Bonky, I want to weigh in there on two yeah. of the Houston Texans that Dave Turp is speaking of. I, I really, uh, I, I'm a big Brevin Jordan fan. I, I like it maybe more than you do, Turp, and I think that's a fantastic. No, I mean he's a he's a outstanding value where he's going. But if you're All team it takes twelve is one good here, season game for him to get moved up. That's true. Team team twelve here. If you're going to go early in quarterback, this is exactly what you do. Davis percent with Josh Allen. That is a, a fantastic, fantastic move. And if they take another quarterback, I'd have to look at the list, but that might be enough. Uh, but yeah, that, that's that's good. Uh, and you get a cheap team. stack for free. Yeah, that's that's a nice looking team there. Turp, we uh, Farrell and I talked about this last night. What do you make of um, going elite tight end and elite quarterback early in the pros versus shows as far as your success? 
Is it's that something tough. you would it's, advocate? It's really difficult. Okay. It's not something I'd recommend doing. I think it's one or the other. Um, I just if you're going to start off and go like an Andrews and then a Josh Allen two rounds later, depending on your roster construction, I just think you're way behind the eight ball to where you're just trying to scramble a little bit too much. You're not as free flowing in your draft. I feel like it's one. Like if you're going to start, we, we go back to team seven. He started off with Kelsey. He got his running back, and then he could pretty much do whatever he wanted. Right. And while you know some of us might not agree with his running, his running back room looks way better than it did a half hour ago. All he needs <laughs> is one of those guys. And Swift to be what Swift is, what most people think he's going to be, to me, through 15 or 17 rounds now, Team 7's hands down the best team. You know, and that's the other thing we should bring up, too, is like like we we look at the, the ceiling for Pete Overzet's team, and it's certainly very high. But the other thing to keep in mind is DeAndre Swift is not exactly a guy, and I know he's talked with his coaches about this this offseason. He's not exactly been a guy who's played through injuries, right? One thousand percent. Yeah. You know, and and so and the thing is with Swift, like in order for this to work out for Overzet, we're all just assuming Swift and Kelsey are going to crush it. Correct. Well, Kelsey's entering his age thirty three season, and Swift has not played through injuries in the past. So this is like we have to assume in order for this team to be the 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 first place squad. Those guys have to hit, and if they don't, it's going to put a lot of added pressure on James Cook, on Ronald Jones, on Daryl Henderson, on Tyler Algier. And I don't know if you can sustain that over the course of a 17-week season if those guys don't hit. Now, if they do hit, he's looking pretty good right now. Um, guys, let's go through, before we go through round 17, let's talk about John Hansen's team. Farrell, I'll throw it to you. When you have drafted best ball squads before in the FFPC, have you ever been this rookie-centric as John Hansen has been tonight. Brees Hall, um, Kenneth Walker, Sky Moore, Damian Pierce, Jahan Dotson, Jamison Williams, George Pickens, Brian Robinson, all these rookies on this squad represent a lot of upside, but they also represent a low floor as well. Well, he's going to live with them. You know, John came in here and, and he accepted the invite. He didn't spend any money on this team. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, he's a, he's a, He's drafting like a guy that was invited here, and he's not here for a long time, but damn, he's here for a good time. And he doesn't have to manage this team. And uh, these are all exciting players. And uh, he he let us off tonight as a great guest. So go get them, John. There's still some rookies to have out there. And by the way, Alex Polanco Jr. also chiming in on the YouTube chat, Farrell. He says the biggest winner with the Mechie News is indeed Brevin Jordan. He is locked in step with you as we go to round 17. Speaking of rookies, a few of them went this round. Hassan Haskins to Hussein Aksu from Fantasy Couch. Samir White to Roy Perenzuela and Corey Hanstein. Uh, Jerick McKinnon off the board to Todd Burrows, followed by a bunch of receivers. Marvin Jones to Michael App. Curtis Samuel goes to Jason Petropoulos. Jamison Crowder is the selection for Michael Zuka, followed by another rookie out of Kentucky, Farrell. Wandale Robinson to Peter Overzet. Cam, uh, excuse me, Cameron, yeah, Cameron Bray is the third tight end selected by Julio Fuentes. Sony Michelle after that, followed by David Bell, the recently pupped David Bell by the Cleveland Browns, going to Josh and Laura Durham. Taysen Hill, the tight end in the tight end in New Orleans. Uh, going to uh, Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell. And then Chris Evans completing things with Brian Harris, uh, the final pick of the 17th round. Uh, Terp, what do you make of Chris Evans this year? Because we have seen his ADP move significantly ahead of Samaj P. Ryan, who I believe was just recently pupped by the Cincinnati Bengals. Captain America, Chris Evans, getting a lot of love. Farrell and I talked about him last night. What say you about Chris Evans this year? In a he should be getting that? all the positive press right now. He's better. I mean, he's he could easily be standalone value. I mean, he is a, a talented, talented kid. I think he's going to get plenty of pass game work. P. Ryan, in my opinion, will get phased out very quickly. And when you're talking about handcuffs and you're taking, talking about lottery tickets, I can't imagine a better lottery ticket right now in, in – 17th round yeah. on an offense like the Cincinnati Bengals and Chris Evans. Over the last couple of weeks, I've actually been regretting my P. Ryan shares. I'm like, man, I can't <laughs> believe I'm getting this guy this cheap. And then I realize, oh, everybody's picking Evans. That's why I'm getting him so cheap. Um, Farrell, I've heard the argument by not just one, but several um, uh, fantasy pros out there. And I don't mean, I shouldn't have put pros in parentheses. They're pros. They know what they're doing. But the argument for Deshaun Watson when he was at Clemson and focusing on Hunter Renfro, could David Bell be the Hunter Renfro for Deshaun Watson in Cleveland this year? 
I don't know. Bell's got to get on the field. Bell's got some. Bell's got to play faster than his time speed. I just, there's been a lot of questions ever since they blew the whistle on Purdue's last uh, football game. There's just been a lot of questions about this player. So, yeah, the, the, thank God we have a preseason, and that's what I'll be trying to determine about Bell. But he's he's not on any of, of uh, any of my menus towards success. Uh, but uh, you know, I. Speaking of menus, uh, the, the homestead uh, in our Burks versus Woods, that would be a good selection. Terp, Whatever you want. Yeah, I don't plan on losing it, so I'm not worried <laughs> about it. They, they serve. That, has, has Burks even been drafted yet? Uh, yeah, uh, he's been selected. It doesn't I'm, matter when he's drafted. Going the selective process, yeah. Not worried yeah. about it. I, I like you buying into the rookie uh, – I like you buying into the rookie wide receiver. He was my favorite receiver coming out. Thing. We're going to have to get this wagering thing going. I kind of like that. So that's Tra- cool. Tra- Makes Tra- things Burks. interesting. It does make things interesting. Um, Traylon Burks off the board at the 10.02 tonight. What? He was the fourth receiver drafted by uh, Curtis Patrick gift. from Rotoviz and Burks. Ryan McDowell from uh, Dynasty League Football. That's where Traylon Burks went. And I love ro- rookie wide receivers, guys. I I truly love the potential of rookie wide receivers. Uh, they're not all C.D. Lamb. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Terp, um, Roy Perenzuela and Corey Hanstein, the uh, drafters, the bombers, um, the FFPC Joe's drafting at the two spot tonight. They ended up starting off their draft pretty strong. Um, we, we talked about it earlier, uh, two receivers and then three running backs. What do you make of them having three quarterbacks and three tight ends through the first 15 rounds of the draft? Is that something that that can work here? In my opinion, if it was me, the Tannehill pick's kind of a wasted pick. Okay. The three tight ends, they kind of did it out of necessity. They didn't have any, so they're just drafting, just like team one did with quarterbacks. They're taking three guys and hoping one of them, one and a half maybe, emerge to where they're a consistent weekly guy for them that can, you know, catch that gap up that they're losing against other teams. I'd be 100% fine with if I'm getting Hurts and Fields, they're two of my highest owned quarterbacks so far, especially Fields, to take them and run with it. They just present so much rushing upside. Fields with a new coaching staff. I mean, he looked awful last year, but – I really, really am a little I'm higher on the Bears than most people, especially Mooney, especially Komet. Target shares there. People talk about it all the time. It's a beat, it's a broken record on the internet right now. But the Tannehill pick is not for me. I, I I can tell you I am not high on the Bears for three reasons. One, I don't think their offense is good. Two, they are the rivals of my Green Bay Packers. And three, I cannot get behind these these orange helmets they introduced today. That's fair. That's not fair. a fan. Not a fan of the orange helmets. I'm still waiting for you to tell me who's going to be the leading receiver in in Green Bay. I I, I don't because I, I don't see it. Turf, if I knew, I would let you know. You'd be the everybody first keeps saying Alan Lazard. Like Alan Lazard's that, going to be going against that, that is the corners now. That is the money I don't right see now. It. That that's the money right now. Is, is everybody everybody keeps saying it? I don't see it. I like, I, I think I like the guys that know the Dubs, the Amari Rogers. And, okay, tickets on them. You guys ready for a hot take here? I'll give you a hot take. You love Romeo, Romeo Dubs. Dubs. Romeo I Dubs. You're coming with that. Romeo Dubs outscores Christian Watson for fantasy this year. I have I a won. bet of Christian Watson versus Drake London this year, so right. I hope not. But right. I'm a little regretting the bet, just a tad. But there, we'll see. It, it, it's it's well, well. I mean, I'm in the throes of um, the shadows of Lambeau Field here in Northeast Wisconsin, and I have heard this on a national level. I've heard it on a local level. People love themselves some Romeo Dubs. Mm-hmm. So and and. and and he is, and say what you will about Christian Watson, much higher ceiling than Dubs, but Dubs is the more pro ready receiver. It wouldn't shock me at all if all of a sudden. Question is, does Aaron Rodgers love him? That's it. Really does it? Well, yeah. I mean, well, the thing is that there's one receiver. There's two receivers he loves right now. Randall Cobb, he has an insane man crush with, and I think that's Dusty, why he can't. Dusty I, listen, Randall I'll tell you this: we're always following Aaron Rodgers' girlfriends and and fiancés mm-hmm. and whatever. Um, and he can't seem to keep him. And I think it's because Randall Cobb keeps popping up in his life. That's, how much, that's how much he loves Randall Cobb. That could um, be a hot take. And that, that could be a hot take. <laughs> um, I know he likes Alan Lazard as well. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But I don't – the thing is, Terp, like at this point, I don't think anybody's a league winner in that in that Packers passing game unless you count Aaron Jones. He could be a league winner this year. Mm-hmm. 
Um, 18th round, guys. Let's let's get through it here. We'll kick things off with Dearness Johnson to Brian Harris. Isaiah McKenzie, the receiver in Buffalo, goes to um, McDowell and Patrick there. Greg Dulcich, third tight end drafted by Josh and Laura Durham. Terrace Marshall from Carolina goes to John Hansen. Trey Sermon off the board, the San Francisco 49ers running back to Julio Fuentes. Uh, Trey McBride, rookie uh, tight end in Arizona, goes to Peter Overzet. Raheem Mostert to Mike Zuka. Kenyon Drake, another running back, goes to Jason Petropoulos. Paris Campbell, uh, Campbell out of uh, Indianapolis, goes to Michael App. Tyler Conklin, tight end, third tight end drafted by uh, Todd Burroughs, uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones, DPJ to the PVJ Bombers, Roy Paranzuela and Corey Hanstein, and then Marcus Mariota. The fourth quarterback drafted by Hussein Aksu. Is that overkill, Farrell? Four quarterbacks in this format? Uh, Yeah. I think uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm higher on his quarterbacks than Terp is, but the, the fourth one didn't didn't need to go off the board. Not I, that fourth one. My favorite players in this round are, are Donovan Peoples-Jones. I'll always have a soft spot. Um for Mostert, uh, your your prior question about Watson, the Peoples Jones would be would be my answer. And uh, the rookie tight ends uh, uh, here, McBride and Dulich, uh, yeah, I, I like those players. It just depends how quickly they can get into step in that offense. So yeah, I feel like the curve right. with rookie tight ends are just you keep hearing about Albert O's falling and keeps mm-hmm. going down draft boards. I just don't see any of these rookies. Look at Kyle Pitts last year. He had a good season, but yeah. where he was drafted, I know these guys are seventeenth, yeah. eighteenth round picks, but yeah. in an offense well, with Russell Wilson, I don't. Uh, Friar Muth was a uh, uh, Friar Muth was a very successful rookie tight end, and that is an yeah, outlier. That is, yeah, that is an outlier when you look at it overall. Remember those two but, tight ends in, in New England drafted a couple of years ago, Devin. Oh my word! Can't think oh, of his goodness. last name. Yeah. Well, but the that's Stiers. that's the New England round. But yeah, and they drafted somebody else like the next round, and everybody was like, "All right, breakout tight ends." And I, I think they yeah, caught one no, pass all season. No, no, they never even got those players. Never even got started. These players have have a different a different resume. But yeah, both it's talented kids. Like, you know, both we're dealing with kids. a seventeen week season, and um, you know, You're we, we, for want, we want some players stepping up towards the end of the year. This, uh, you know, his other tight ends are Hunter Henry. Uh, a little long in the tooth as far as players go. And and you said you like Ingram. I like Ingram's potential, but you talk about a guy who hasn't cashed in. Now you think he's escaping uh, the New York Giants. And, and, and man, he's coming to Doug Peterson there. who loves his tight ends. Say it again. He's got with a new coach and Doug Peterson who loves his tight ends. I agree with that. I don't know if he's going to love one in the land of Gators. I don't know if he's going to love one with the alligator <laughs> arms of Evan Ingram. But we'll see. I I love a lot of Jacksonville Jaguars this year. It worries me just a little bit because of the Jaguars. <laughs> but I mean, term, and- I drafted one of these uh, our one hundred and twenty five dollar uh, never too early best balls. Mm-hmm. Uh, I drafted it. And I stacked five Raiders and six Jags, and you know it's it's fun to look. You back didn't sleep that night. What were you thinking? No, <laughs> you woke up the next morning like. Cold what, sweats, what, like what, what happened? happened? Exactly. <laughs> Clearly, this wasn't my team. I drafted someone <laughs> else in this draft. Um, guys, the 19th round is completed. Uh, Julio Jones uh, off the board here uh, tonight to Hussein Aksu from Fantasy Couch. Randall Cobb to Perenzuela and Hanstein. Zay Jones is the pick here uh, for Team 3 tonight. That's Todd Burrows. James Washington, the new receiver for the Dallas Cowboys. Off the board to Michael App. Jeff Wilson going to Jason uh, Petropolis. Followed by K.J. Hamler to Michael Zuka. Peter Overzet takes LaVisca Chenault. A couple of tight ends off the board. Julio Fuentes takes Adam Troutman. John Hansen takes Jonu Smith. Jonu Smith, I think, exceeding the age uh, limit for John Hansen on his squad this year. But to each their own. Eno Benjamin off the board here to Josh and Laura Durham. Curtis Patrick from Rotoviz, Ryan McDowell from Dynasty League Football take William Fuller. Nick Westbrook Ikini is the last pick of the 19th round to um, uh, Brian uh, Brian Harris, the FFPC Joe Terp. Um, everybody's excited about Traylon Burks and, and Robert Woods. Is there value in an FFPC best ball to uh, for Westbrook Ikini, a guy who has has flashed before in the past? Had, enough, this- had a really nice puff piece today too. Oh, he did. I did not he see did. that. He had so, nice puff piece. I read that he was the most consistent receiver so far early oh. in, in camp. 
So are you are you buying into that as a late round best ball pick? As a nineteenth round pick, he, he definitely brings upside. You know, he he's definitely okay. could be. You don't know yeah. Robert Woods coming back from the injury. Burks, you know, he clearly had some issues early in camp. Now he's coming back. He's a rookie. They drafted him high. They have a lot of capital in him, but still, the, the unknowns there. He has the rapport with Tannehill. Why not? Farrell, um, LaVisca Chenault goes here uh, tonight as uh, as Peter Overzet's pick, an, another receiver here after he hammered the receivers early. He was supposed to be so awesome for Jacksonville. That didn't happen. Doug Peterson is there now. Is that enough to unlock Chenault as a signed-off Farrell Elliott stamped sleeper in the 19th round? Oh, no, that's the one Jacksonville Jag I didn't take. And, you know, I was a little bit on the fence for him. And now that uh, Pete's taking him, I'm, I'm just, no. Nor is not going to do it. But no, I think seriously. You might have a picture Chenault, of his wall off Chenault. <laughs> <laughs> Chenault is, uh, I like some of these other receivers, uh, including Hamler a, lo- a little better. Uh, I agree completely uh, with Dave Turk on Westbrook Hakeen. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, you can't. Um, you can't say anything about Chenault other than he's got the opportunities. He's got an unusual physicality, but there's a lot of great offensive weapons now at Jacksonville and the quarterback's going to play better. And, you know, it might be going forward with guys that have a future there and still looking back in Jacksonville. Also good picks with Julio and Fuller. They're 19th round picks. They could be starters very quickly. Yeah. Terp, how do you handle guys like that who aren't signed here coming up in late July? What do you, you do have to that? take some shots, especially in these drafts. You know, even in a best ball where you can't cut these guys, you can't cut them. But the upside, they could easily. If Will Fuller or Julio Jones goes to Green Bay, they could be the number one receiver. Okay. Where are you going to get that opportunity in the nineteenth round? Um, they go to Baltimore. They could be the number two receiver behind Bateman, very yes. very easily. We can go down the list. If they go to Houston right now, not that either one will, but either if either of them go to Houston right now, like who's really standing in their way besides Brandon Cooks? If they went to the Green Bay Packers, term, <laughs> Which, I mean, they're both pretty – I mean, Will Fuller definitely has more talent. Julio Jones is more dusty, but still. Now, Terp, Terp, here's the question. Here's the question. If Julio Jones or Will Fuller goes to Green Bay, does that mean Watkins gets cut? I don't even know why Watkins is still on the team. Okay, so yes. <laughs> so yes is the answer there. Go Keep ahead. Watkins for the first week. He's going to go for like 40 fantasy points. But then yeah, you got to go nuts. Yeah, no, no. You got to get Here's the thing. Like that's fine for fantasy. If Green Bay keeps him for week 1, his contract's guaranteed. Well, Green yeah, Bay's not cutting all him. That stuff. Like they're going to keep him around. Um, He's the, I, I think Watkins makes the team. I I don't think yeah. easy. I don't think Rodgers is going to go with a bunch of rookies. I think Watson or or Dubs or one of those guys are probably going to open the season on, you know, Pup or whatever, or on the you know practice squad possibly if they make it through. Not Watson, obviously, but definitely Dubs. If Watkins is healthy and he's not hamstrung or one of his other hundred injuries that he has his whole career, he probably will be on the roster. All right. So, um, Terp, last thing I want to ask you here: um, big difference in Tim Patrick and KJ Hamler tonight. Most people, and, and according to the data and Fantasy Mojo, the top two Denver Broncos receivers are Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy. Tim Patrick goes in the 11th tonight to Todd Burroughs. K.J. Hamler doesn't go until the 19th round tonight to Mike Zuka. Is that too big of a disparity between those receivers, or are you betting on a big year from Tim Patrick and Russell Wilson? I don't think so. I think Tim Patrick's the perfect number three receiver for Denver. There's really it's really hard not to like what he brings. But for to fantasy the team. value between the two here, Patrick and Hamler. Because Patrick, I, mean, I don't even know where he was drafted, but Hamler was a second round pick two years ago. Yeah, Hamler definitely has the big play potential. I just think they have enough big play potential on that team. Is he ever gonna play over Cortland Sutton? Is he ever like is he ever gonna play over Judy? I know Judy is hated by a lot of people, but I just don't see a guy who's coming off two major injuries. Yeah, he might flash here and there, but he could be obsolete really quickly. I, I'm not a Hamler guy, but I, in the 19th round, the 20th round, in this type of format, it's a lightning in the bottle that's worth taking, but I don't think the disparity is – I think it's clearly should be. 
Um, guys, that, that is a wrap on tonight's draft. Just to run you through the 20th round, Vilas Jones at the 2001, CJ Uzuma to Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell, followed by Tyler Batty. And then uh, back-to-back Steelers quarterbacks here. Kenny Pickett goes before Mitch Trubisky, who goes with the very next pick after that. Uh, Trubisky going to Julio Fuentes, Tommy Tremble, A.J. Green, Devin Duvernay, uh, the Baltimore Ravens uh, receiver, goes off the board here with the fifth to last pick. That was to uh, Jason Petropoulos. Quez White in Philadelphia, Terp Sky. That completes a run of five straight receivers for Michael App. Desmond Ritter, the rookie quarterback out of Atlanta. And then Rob Gronkowski, the obligatory Rob Gronkowski pick. We can't get away from it. Doesn't matter. He could be retired for four years. He could be inducted into the Hall of Fame. He's still going to be drafted in the FFPC pros versus shows at some point. The penultimate pick tonight for Roy Perenzuela and Corey Hanstein. And then the final pick, Mr. Irrelevant, is indeed Tyquan Thornton, the rookie receiver for the New England Patriots to fantasy couches Hussein Aksu. Final thoughts on tonight's draft, gentlemen. Uh, I know it's a broad question. Do you have any thoughts on your favorite team, worst team, favorite pick when you look at this, worst pick when you look at this, anything that stood out to you, anything that surprised you? Terp, I'm going to throw this to you first. Do you have any thoughts here of, of if if these viewers that were watching this broadcast live on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, if they take away one thing from tonight's draft, what should it be? Draft like Team 7. Team 7, Peter Overzet. Fantasy life, Matthew Berry's fantasy life. Uh, love the love the picks. Went um, elite tight end early, elite running back early. Pounded the receivers and then pounded the running backs and then peppered in some quarterbacks and uh, tight ends at the end. Trey Lance, Trevor Lawrence, Baker Mayfield, Trey McBride, Tommy Tremble, along with Travis Kelsey. Farrell, do you agree with that uh, assertion by Terp there? You know what? He uh, he got very lucky because I don't necessarily think those. Uh, his run of running backs, I can see the potential for his second running back to emerge from that group. So, yes, I think he's very lucky. Uh, I, I'm a little – and, you know, Terp seems to be a, a, a passionate uh, champion of Justin Fields. I, I'm a little surprised. I wouldn't that, say passionate champion. Well, you, you, you say. said – hey, well, here's – you said something positive about him, and that moves the meter – as passionate champion here because we're, I'm just not hearing a lot. It's a great uh, stack down right now. Great about stack. Justin Fields. So I, um, that's probably one of my least favorite picks uh, in this draft. Uh, but these guys know what they're doing. These guys come in here with a plan. And, uh, you know, we look at everyone that's involved in this. You can tell they've done a great deal of work. With Extremely talented guys. Yeah, they understand Pro the team. Joe, it's both of them. You know, they've they, they got they've got a they've got a wise idea of who the players are. You look at this last round, the last three rounds. Terps right on it. I mean, these guys can step up and and be the guys for you. So yeah, there, there's not a lot of dead picks on this board. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you for hopping aboard tonight. You certainly made my job very easy. I think you entertained the masses tonight. Well, I know you entertained the masses much more than I did. I appreciate all your insight, all your picks. Terp, we will follow you on Twitter at Dave Terp. Farrell, we will uh, check out the KFFSC at KFFSC.com. And um, I, we are going to, and Terp, I'm going to send you the link to the broadcast tomorrow. Hopefully you can join, but we start once again an hour later. We're going to go on at 10 Eastern tomorrow. I hope you guys can both make it. I'll be there. All right. Terp is there. Farrell, you're going to be there? I'll Have see you. Have a good night, guys. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Dave Terpoli and Farrell Elliott, ladies and gentlemen, the definitive commissioner of fantasy football and the definitive critic of fantasy football. I guess that's Terp's new nickname on the program, which I, I, I like quite a bit. I want to thank tonight's guest, ladies and gentlemen, John Hanson, the fantasy guru. Listen to him on Sirius XM Fantasy Football Mornings from 6 until 10 a.m. Eastern. Of course, Dave Terpoli, who we talked to, Todd Burrows, the Run to Daylight podcast, and, of course, Peter Overzet from Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. Um, remember, the High Stakes Fantasy Footballer normally airs on Friday nights right on this FFPC YouTube channel at 10, 9 Central. We also air live on Twitter and Facebook and, obviously, on-demand streaming via audio and video listing, basically wherever you get your audio podcast and video podcast the next day and uh, at hsffhour.com as well. 
Uh, so if you this is the first time you're checking us out, we appreciate it. We do this show year round, uh, year uh, uh, hour long, 10, 9 central on Fridays. I want to thank all our drafters tonight. Uh, was tremendous. We are going to be back tomorrow at 10 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, the Joes uh, tomorrow, Rashad Cobb, who you heard on these airwaves just a few months ago. Uh, former guest of the show, Shelly Fossum, also drafting for the FFPC Joes tomorrow. Jason Steves, another former guest of the show, Justin Baker and John Brock the FFPC Joe Tan and picking from the seven spot tomorrow. Liz Ballard, who I think I can break this right now. She will be Friday night's guest on the high stakes fantasy football. hour. we're talking about this squad. She is drafting tomorrow. And from the nine spot, the final Joes are Chris and Alan Chapman picking from the 11, the uh, pros tomorrow. We're going to have Matt Schauf from DraftSharks.com, Ben Gretsch and Sean Siegel from stealing signals and Rotoviz respectively will be drafting tomorrow. Establish the run is going to have another entrant. It's Jack Miller. He's going to be selecting tomorrow. The 33rd teams, Josh Larkey will be on the program. Jeff Mance, GuruElite.com, And of course, Drew Davenport from football guys, all drafting tomorrow. That is quite the lineup of Joe's. It is also quite the lineup of pros. It's going to be a fun one tomorrow. Don't miss it. 10 p.m. Eastern time. Main event early draft slot deadline is coming up, ladies and gentlemen. We are about four hours away from that. Remember to get in on that. Once your team is paid for in full by midnight Pacific time tonight, you're going to get your early draft slot by August 1st. So whether you're drafting in mid-August, late August, early September, you're going to have plenty of time to prep for your FFPC main event quest for a $1 million industry record grand prize. Main event slow drafts. If you don't want to wait for your draft slots, you can draft them right now. We got those off and running. Multiple football guys drafts filling up each and every day at myffpc.com. We have two separate best ball tournaments. The FFPC best ball tournament, $125 to enter, $200,000 grand prize. The super flex best ball tournament, $35 to enter, $10,000 grand prize as well. If you want to play in Dynasty, we've never had a league fold. We got over 1,000 of them, and we continue to fill up Dynasty startups each and every day at myffpc.com. If you are like the pros versus Joe's drafters and you just want to compete in a closed 12-team league like this, you can do that in Best ball, classic, varsity, Terminator, Superflex, whatever format you want at myffpc.com. And of course, the Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship main event, the Run to Daylight Championship, taking on all comers at kffsc.com. You can compete against me there, and hopefully we get Turp in one of those drafts too this year as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening and watching. We really appreciate it. Your week officially continues right now. <laughs>one other thing I should mention tonight, I was uh, I came from my son's uh, rookie league baseball game. They lost in the championship last year. Proud to say they won in the semifinals this year, 11 to 4. They will be participating in the championship game for the second straight year, this time as the one seed on Wednesday night. Very excited for that. Now I have to uh, do a little post-production on this podcast, watch the latest episode of Better Call Saul, and of course I have to watch with an eagle eye uh, Silver Linings Playbook. I got to rewatch that and see if I can find Dave Terpoli in there. Very excited to see that. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll talk to you at 10, 9 central tomorrow right here on the FFPC YouTube channel.